Ateneo de Manila University's third sociology and anthropology undergraduate student research conference entitled Identities, Institutions, and Inequalities. On this day, May 4, 2022, at the Ateneo de Manila University. Um, to open today's uh, presentations, today's conference, we welcome Dr. Jose Joel Ticanuday. Um, Chair of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology for his opening remarks. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning for the students and uh, colleagues, faculty on site, and uh, students and faculty online. Um, I, I realized that we have many firsts uh, in this endeavor. This is the first time that uh, we're doing it in, in, in this manner, on-site and online uh, simultaneously. Perhaps being first of this kind of setup of modality uh, might yet be a, a sign to come that, that this might be the future of how we will be engaging uh, each other in learning sociology and anthropology. So I'm, I'm, I'm very happy where the department is, uh, is excited uh, in pushing through and, and, and organizing uh, this kind of setup uh, because this, this, this presents what could be the future for us. Another first that, of course, that I am, uh, I've been thinking about is that this would be the first AB sociology, sociology and anthropo anthropology conference from the first batch of AB sociology, who successfully flowed through, pushed through, up ahead in the last four years of uh, education. Despite, of course, the challenges, pandemic, the being confined, cooped up in, in our uh, corners, little corners uh, where we study. And, and here we are, the, the resilience uh, from that uh, vulner vulnerability that we all uh, face uh, at the height of the pandemics, the lockdown, and, and social distancing uh, measures that was imposed. Uh, it shows us the remarkable spirit of, of, of this cohort and also of, of, of the colleagues as well who had flowed through uh, this uh, endeavor. So two firsts uh, for, for, for this engagement. And then being first, as I noted early on, uh, may yet be a sign of things to come. Now, the theme of this conference as organized by uh, your professors uh, is identities, help me out, Jerry. Uh, I, I couldn't see the, the identities, institutions, and inequalities. Sorry about that. This is a timeless uh, question and a timeless um, engagement in the field of sociology and anthropology. Our collective view our collective assessment uh, of, of, of these concepts, problems, and, and, and possibilities sets us uh, in, towards the path of, of, of contribution uh, to the better understanding of our society. Now more than ever, I think the, the insights and, and uh, your contributions in understanding each of these concepts is very relevant. We're coming in, of course, in the next few days uh, in a crucial historical uh, elections. We're in identities and uh, inequalities or questions of, of institutions, strengthening of institutions and or deepening of inequalities might be at stake, uh, might be at the forefront uh, of the election question. So in that spirit, I wish us, everyone, colleagues and students 
and uh, also uh, those who may who may stream or who may who may watch the the, the streaming uh, uh, with us to to join us uh, in unpacking, understanding, and expanding uh, our assessments of societies, peoples, and uh, communities. Uh, lastly, I would also acknowledge the participation of non Ateneo AB Sociology and uh, Anthropology students, whom I believe is also uh, joining us in this conference. And I hope the rest of the students, AB Sociology from Ateneo de Manila, and uh, the colleagues would also welcome uh, those who will be participating, those who will be asking uh, from outside the walls of our institution. Thank you very much and uh, more power to everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Kanudai, for encouraging our students, our non Ateneo participants, and everyone here joining us on Zoom and on live stream in today's discussion of identities and institutions and inequalities. So uh, without further ado, I think we would be opening our first panel uh, entitled Disruptions, Adaptations, and Responses to the Pandemic. With us are three groups of student presenters. First presenting on how health frontliners responded to the challenges um, in a private hospital during the COVID-19 pandemic. SPED disrupted uh, a study on how the COVID-19 affected pediatric special education and therapy in select metro Manila cities. And mailuluwal ba ang dalamhati, drawing out viable lives from the pandemic grieving spaces. Okay, are we set for uh, first presenter? For our first presenter, we will be joined by Daniel Encarnacion, Leandro Lira, and Romulo Victor Berge, Berge, sorry, for the presentation of uh, how health frontliners respond to the challenges in a private hospital in Batangas, Philippines during the COVID-19 pandemic. Their thesis su supervisor is Ms. Yen Roldan, and their reviewers are doctors. Yufrasho Abaya and Dr. Enrique Nina Leviste. I turn over to the group now. Thank you. Hello. So good morning, everyone. This is our research. Good morning, everyone. This is our research titled How Health Frontline Respond to the Challenges in a Private Hospital in Batangas, Philippines during the COVID-19 pandemic. So next. Okay, so this is essentially our floor presentation. So just a disclaimer, the abstract introduction and aim of the study and the research questions will be done pre-recorded because our group mate, Romulo, cannot be uh, here right now. Just testing to see if you guys can see. The aim of our research is to determine and analyze the response of doctors and nurses working in a medical institution in Batangas City, Philippines, toward the challenges that affect their daily practice. And experiences. The aim of our research is to determine and analyze the response of doctors and nurses working in a medical institution in Batangas City, Philippines, toward the challenges that affect their daily practices and experiences as, as health frontliners. In doing so, we approached this using the practice theory, which helped us delve into how the current roles and duties of these health professionals change on a work, interactional, institutional, and personal level during the pandemic. Sorry, technical difficulties. <laughs> Um, how... 
How about okay? Um, we will mute the live stream first so that I can. <laughs> The aim of our research is to determine and analyze the response of doctors and nurses working in a medical institution in Batanga City, Philippines, toward the challenges that affect their daily practices and experiences as, as health frontliners. In doing so, we approach this using the practice theory, which helped us delve into how the current roles and duties of these health professionals change on a work, interactional, institutional, and personal level during the pandemic. Our research included eight participants. These eight participants consisted of five doctors and three nurses. The, the responses of the aforementioned were thematically analyzed, wherein we, we identified the themes and sub-themes found within the responses. Most of these responses indicate that the COVID-19 pandemic experience took a heavy toll on the mental health of the participants. Consequently, the participants showed appreciation toward the value of the roles that each department plays in a medical institution. Through this, the aforementioned indicate a need for a better overall healthcare system. Our research focuses on the impact of the global pandemic on the lives of health frontliners. Evidently, this pandemic has had a major impact on the di dynamics of our lives. Examples of these are the lockdowns, city and provincial quarantines, wearing of face shields and face masks, social distancing, and the recently implemented alert level systems. There was a severe strain on the, on the functioning of medical institutions brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. Medical institutions had trouble gathering resources to cater to their COVID-positive patients. These were face masks, face shields, PPEs, and many more, and had difficulty admitting patients due to the volume of individuals that seek medical attention. Our research aims to understand how healthcare professionals respond to the challenges brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. With this, we aim to focus on the challenges in their daily practices and the challenges that affect their work activities and experiences as social actors working within the hospital. For our data gathering process, we have provided three main research questions for our participants. These are, number one, what are the challenges or struggles faced by health frontliners in terms of their daily practices and experiences due to the COVID-19 pandemic? How did the health frontliners respond to these different issues? And lastly, what are the different rules of departments in the hospital? All right. So in interpreting the individual's actions, there's a plethora of forces that are manipulating their performance. In our context, we focus on two, social structures and social practices. In our analysis, we inquire if this is out of their own control or if this is our social responsibility. Practice theory analyzes the social practices and actions of people, separate from the actors and the social structures. The theory aims to better comprehend how and why individuals follow rules and social standards, as well as how people can be driven by society and not by their own free will, and vice versa. The people's roles and responsibilities, as well as their relationships with their fellow colleagues and patients, form the social structures that exist in the medical settings. This plays a heavy role in our study, as during the COVID-19 pandemic, hospitals and other medical institutions have been actively responding and adjusting to the ongoing struggles against the virus. Medical frontliners follow certain rules in order to continue practicing and fulfilling their medical responsibilities. With all these in mind, the researchers intend to provide a better understanding on the effects of COVID-19 pandemic and the adjustments hospitals and medical institutions made and how it affects the individual behavior and activity of frontliners. This research, <clears throat> this research, in line with the practice theory, analyzes how COVID-19 pandemic affects frontliners' response to the disruptions of their daily practices in the private hospital. As this case study focuses on the comparing the personal experiences and frontliners throughout the pandemic, the researchers also wanted to find out specific issues and challenges that were with the interactions made by frontliners as the medical settings. In summary, 
The COVID-19 has affected the daily practices and experiences of healthcare frontliners. Given this, the researchers aim to examine how frontliners from the private hospital in Batanga City have responded to the changes brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. This allowed researchers to delve deeper into the coping strategies these frontliners practice in response to the challenges and adjustments made. The researchers thematically analyzed the insights and key informants regarding their daily experiences and perceptions. This allowed the researchers to identify different themes and subthemes. Moreover, researchers gathered secondary resources from their COVID-19 impacts on host hospitals, healthcare workers, and how doctors treated patients before and during the pandemic. Lastly, researchers use practice theory to study and re-examine the practices of these frontliners amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. So in, so in terms of our methodology, our research design used a descriptive phenomenological approach as this gave us a deeper, in, a deeper understanding towards the, the insights, information, and narratives of these health frontliners regarding their response to the challenges of working in the hospital during the COVID-19 pandemic. So we chose a hospital in Batanga City because at the time, Batanga City had the highest number of COVID-19 cases in all of Batanga's province. And apart from this, the private hospital was a secondary multi-specialization hospital that treats patients from Batanga City and other neighboring provinces and has been actively treating COVID cases. So in terms of the profile of the research participants, a snowball sampling was used through one of the doctor participants as a point interviewee. So the point interview we contacted for other doctors while the researchers sent a letter to the human resource officer of the private hospital to provide nurses. So the researchers contact, contacted a total of five doctors and six nurses. All doctors were interviewed, while out of the six nurses, only three were interviewed. So here's a profile of the research participants and the inclusion characteristics. And in terms of our data gathering methods, so data collection happened from February 16th to, to March 21. We conducted online interviews in which we got our primary data. And as mentioned by Daniel, our secondary data revolved around media reports, news articles, and texts. And these were all organized through Wilfredo Arce's SDCS chart. So in terms of our data analysis, Colitis method was used to thematically analyze and transcribe the results of the research responses through different themes and subthemes. So in terms of our results, the discussion revolves around the identified themes and analysis from the data collection. So given these four themes, the multi-directional arrows suggest that these challenges reach and affect how frontliners respond to the challenges of working in the hospital. So here are the code names of the respondents along with their profession, specialty, and the number of years working in the hospital. So the first theme focuses on work-related challenges or issues that doctors experience when doing their daily practice in the hospital during the pandemic. So the first theme, both doctors and nurses shared their preference for pre-pandemic conditions as doc Dr. Bert would mention how life was easy back then and how treating patients revolved around smooth, smooth flows in ins and outs. So following this, going to the going to the pandemic, Dr. Enrique would mention how initial stages meant that there were no protocols yet and they didn't know what was effective. There were no RT-PCRs readily available as facilities nearby could not provide them with such. So for Nurse Yoli, they would mention the man manpower as of now, as nurses would leave for different reasons, leave the hospital for different reasons, whether it be leaving for other countries, going to te for temporary treatment moratorium facilities, or just leaving the hospital in general to stay with their families due to fear of COVID. So in terms of treatments of COVID and non-COVID patients, Dr. Doming would mention that all patients were treated the same or in that all were asymptomatic because they can still be positive and they can still contact the virus, whether COVID or non-COVID case. So in terms of how, front, how health frontliners prioritize different COVID-19 patients, Dr. Chrysostomo would mention that there was a hierarchy that doctors use to determine who gets treated first or not, and this depends on the severity of the patients. Lastly, for this theme, it, it's about finding alternate modes of treatment for outpatients or patients that cannot be admitted to the hospital. Dr. Allen emphasized the use of telemedicine where it was an online platform where patients and doctors could, could talk to one another virtually 
whereas Dr. Domic would mention home care services wherein groups of doctors and nurses would go to the houses of these patients that could not be treated in the hospital. The COVID-19, sorry. The COVID-19 virus brought about numerous challenges given its high transmittability. Doctors and nurses fall under the category of essential workers and frontliners, considering that their occupations to treat both COVID and non-COVID patients. This section focuses on the struggles and challenges these frontliners faced with regards to their interactions made throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Much of the accounts regarding the challenges with interactions with their family members highlighted the conditions brought about the by the pandemic as well as the nature of the virus, developed this respondent's fear in contracting and transmitting the COVID-19 virus. This is best captured by Dr. Doming as they expressed anxiety over not knowing what they could have contracted during work and what they could be potentially passing on to their family members. As a precaution, this led them to decrease interactions in families. This fear was also translated further into the hospitals in the form of policies and guidelines requiring frontliners to take extra precautions. Dr. Chrysostomo expounded on this, saying that the fear experienced by patients and their family members when visiting hospitals was a similar fear that hospital staffs experienced in admitting these patients. Other respondents, such as Dr. Doming, expressed how they prioritize the safety of everyone who visits and works in their clinic, providing them with PPEs and other forms of protection in order to continue practicing. Despite these efforts, however, Nurse Rosa still practices with extreme caution to mitigate the the risks and of spreading the disease when coming home from their duties. As the pandemic continued, departments acknowledged the importance of fostering harmonious relationships with other departments. They needed to be mindful of each other's departments' protocols and guidelines with regards to treating patients. Here we have Dr. Bert and Nurse Yoli sharing their experiences in monitoring, supervising, and upholding policies and guidelines for each department to follow in order to maximize safety and functionality in the hospital. Now, coordination was acknowledged to be the most uh, to be have to have been important and has improved in the line of adjustments made between departments and communications. Dr. Enrique expressed that while this has happened, harmonious relationships were bound to happen. While uh, as medical professionals, they are trained to foster environments conducive for coordination. Whichever the case, adjustments came after some time and required everyone's cooperation in order to achieve. Such improvements in departmental co coordination was not experienced by all frontliners, as Nurse Belinda described how nurses, such as themselves, would be given forced leaves, wherein they would take the opportunity to work outside the hospital as a clinical instructor, therefore not being able to experience the, challenge, the changes and challenges in the departmental coordination. It was mentioned previously by Dr. Enrique that doctors naturally work hand in hand with other doctors, a sentiment that was shared by all respondents. However, for nurses, on a unique, uh, on a, a unique, uh, on a unique experience shared by Nurse Belinda, they described that their experiences of seniority among nurses before and during the pandemic. They described seniority as a form of initiation for new nurses in order to learn the responsibilities expected from them. During the pandemic, however, the seniority initiation was withdrawn because nurses were limited and this type of treatment from older nurses might cause newer nurses to even resign. Nurse Belinda describes that the quality of nurses today was not as effective compared to those during their time due to the lack of discipline taught in senior nurses. So in terms of the next theme focuses on the hospital association with different institutions and the aspirations and predictions of health frontliners toward the endemic stage of this pandemic. So in terms of these associations, out of the different institutions of the, ho the hospital was associated with, doctors and nurses shared the failure of health, health to cover different expenses as this affected the hospital, the nurses, the patients, and the doctors. So in terms of aspiration of nurses, they want a better health system. And along with that, they don't want to encourage more nurses to come back to the hospital to improve health care over time. For doctors, two contrasting, two contrasting perspectives appear. For Dr. Burt, they believe that the hospital will loosen up and will prioritize non-COVID patients in the future, whereas Dr. Enrique believes that the alert level one guidelines will remain constant even during post-pandemic. The researchers define personal related challenges as issues experienced by doctors and nurses with regards to their physical, mental, and emotional well being throughout the COVID 19 pandemic. This section, the researchers will identify how all the efforts, responses, and policies that health institutions have made in resilience uh, has affected the resilience and well being of doctors and nurses who are actively adjusting to these changes. 
Now, majority of the respondents experienced varying forms of physical exhaustion. Dr. Enrique shared their experiences of experiencing difficulties in performing their tasks while wearing PPEs, while Dr. Domeng witnessed two nurses performing tasks that were normally designed for eight or more nurses. It was expressed previously that due to the lack of nurses, hospitals were forced to make the available nurses take in more work to prevent the hospital from closing. This is a response that has risked the well-being and lives of many of staff members. Both doctors and nurses express concern over their family, as mentioned previously, and how it has affected their relationship with them. Dr. Bert and Nurse Belinda were so concerned that they resorted to one, moving out of their parents' house, and two, only taking in work that, had, that required little to no contact with COVID patients. There have been cases, however, where the virus does make it to the homes of these frontliners, in which case, Dr. Enrique, who lost her father, and Dr. Chrysostomo, whose entire household tested positive for COVID-19, both exper experienced the attributes of the lack of quality and affordable health care, as well as medical resources to treat patients. Lastly, while these challenges were evident throughout the duration of the pandemic, doctors and nurses learned to adapt and build their resilience against difficulties brought about the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Chrysostomo remarked that there, before the pandemic, doctors already kept themselves updated with the diseases and treatments with practices continuing the COVID-19 pandemic. And while these frontliners were able to develop their resilience throughout the pandemic, doctors and nurses expressed that not all frontliners were able to mobilize during the COVID-19 pandemic, as the resilience that they built was required of them by the, uh, by the institution in order to make up for the lack of manpower. No need. Difficulties and challenges were experienced all throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. However, the initial stages brought about the most stress, not just for frontliners, but for the entire Philippine health system. During this period, very little was known about the COVID-19 virus and its treatment. On top of this, the Philippine health response was ineffective due to the lack of resources, limited access to quality healthcare services, making, it diff making treatment difficult for a lot of frontliners. The lack of knowledge and the high transmission rate of viruses caused great distress for many of the medical professionals, as they were also concerned of their own safety and as well as their families. This being said, many doctors chose to resign and discontinue their practice in fear of contracting the virus and transmitting it. Meanwhile, others continued their practice abroad where they'd receive better income. As a result of the frontliners, work, uh, frontliners health workers' efforts towards addressing these concerns, policies and guidelines were made within the hospitals in order for other, other, and other health institutions to ensure the safety. Such guidelines were con continuously updated every week in relation to the new findings of the virus. Some conflicted with other guidelines that were specialized between departments, which required plenty of coordination to maintain functionality and productivity. While such guidelines were made to prioritize the safety and well-being of these frontliners, um, not all addressed the issues of the limited workforce within the hospital. This forced the remaining frontliners, uh, most especially nurses, to increase their workload. Otherwise, hospitals wouldn't be able to function and treat both COVID and non-COVID patients. Through the experiences of these medical professionals, each of their accounts noted the importance of improving the country's health response to the situation, such as what was experienced. Throughout the conducted interviews, frontliners expressed aspirations towards improving the Philippine healthcare system to become better equipped for immediate response towards future health crises that the country may follow uh, may experience. Resilience was clearly a key factor for many of the remaining frontliners to continue their practice despite the limited resources, insufficient incomes, and personal Can you hear us? 
All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Daniel, Leandro, and RV for your presentation on uh, how co how health frontliners responded to the challenges brought about by the COVID-19. Now, we would like to acknowledge the presence of our reviewers, Dr. Tras Abaya, who is on Zoom, and Dr. Enrique Ina Leviste, who is joining us here on site. We will be opening the floor for questions from your reviewers. I will defer to Dr. Abaya. Uh, muted. <laughs> uh, sir, you're muted. We can't hear you. Okay. Um, thank you, Linio. But actually, you don't have to defer to me. You could have gone ahead. Oh, but uh, nonetheless, um, can you hear me? Uh, rather soft, pop, sir. Let me see. Mayan, can you hear me? Better. Thank you. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. And um, first, I'd like to congratulate the, the team, the group, for having produced a very rich uh, uh, study in terms of primary data. I mean, those narratives are really so valuable. I mean, I, I enjoyed reading all of them. I mean, most of them. I realize how. I mean, that's one marker of your successful research, that you were able to draw out those emotions and ideas from the you know, practitioners and uh, how they struggled and how they were able to surmount their, their, you know, the issues that they had to confront, whether it be institutional or interpersonal, what not have you. And I really do appreciate that. I guess the one, um, the one, uh, Thing that I'd like to you to um, work on further is um, a, an elaboration of how your your findings would connect to the to the theoretical or conceptual frame that you proposed. I think that seems quite weak, and I suggest that you you uh, revisit that conceptual frame and mobilize it whenever appropriate. I mean, in terms of really invoking ideas of the authors that have inspired you in relation to your analysis, you know, don't make those connections. And then finally, in your conclusion, I'd like a reiteration of um, how, again, the framework allowed you to make sense allowed you to contribute to the discourse in sociology of health, okay? So I think you know major, major observation. You, you were able to launch a study with a, you know, interesting question, research questions. However, Mukang, my, my opinion is that the interconnection amongst the research question, the methodology, which would encompass your theoretical frame and your conclusions. Kailangan connected lahat So I'd like you to um, sharpen, you know, those features or items in your study. So I, I'll, I'll give the floor now to Dr. Nino. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Dr. Abaya. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate the team no, for coming up with a well-crafted uh, manuscript. No? I think, first of all, what is commendable really about your paper is the amount of empirical data that you were able to gather, uh, notwithstanding the limited access, no, understandably, that you have, no, having to do it predominantly online. No, but you were nonetheless still able to gather robust or no, relatively robust uh, data, anecdotal evidence. In line with that, uh, my first question has something to do with uh, notions of healthcare because 
Admittedly and understandably, the manuscript focused on um, practices, adjustments, adaptations, and innovations that these medical practitioners had to go through because of the pandemic. So, did you also get an appreciation based on the conversations you had with your partners, with your research partners? No? Did you get a sense of how their notions or their understandings of healthcare changed as well because of the pandemic? Uh, well, I guess in one way, when we were discussing it between group members as well as with our advisor, as well as like uh, as we were going through the transcripts, it really boiled down to the idea that each of these doctors and nurses experienced a lot of things. While it was very common that it was fear that drove them a lot of their uh, like mobilization, uh, as well as the stresses that they experienced within the adjustments that they made, a lot of it, while it seemed stressful for a lot of these nurses and doctors, it didn't seem as if it was stress per se or like their responsibility they simply did it because they knew that there was a well they knew that there was a role that they played in the institution as well as for the country they acknowledged that despite the numbers that they lacked despite the efforts that they were like having to put on um if they stop at this point the response of the like uh, the response of the hospital and the province wouldn't be able to be effectively addressing the issues that they faced. It wasn't something that was locally, like it was experienced locally within their own families, but it was also something that everyone experienced. And because of this shared experiences, they learned to adapt and they learned to grow their resilience in order to address all these concerns. So, yes. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, yes. so um, to, to add to that, it also gave us a deeper appreciation to ver the, in terms of variety of the respondents because we had doctors that were intensivists, general surgeons, ob gynecologists, uh, infectious disease. So just to give a brief understanding of such, it's the way they express their concern of their health and their practice because as doctors, yes, they are doctors, but their specialities show different narratives. So from our paper, that gave us deeper insights to how doctors and nurses, while they do have the same, they also have different. And apart from that, even doctors can have different challenges and different coping mechanisms, such as nurses can have different coping me mechanisms with nurses. So that's all. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Daniel and Enzo. Uh, RV is here with us. Uh, RV, do you have anything to add? Or hi, hi RV. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Good to have you, RV. We can hear you. Uh, hello, po. Nice, nice to see you, po. Um, I share uh, the same answers with uh. Daniel and Enzo, I think um, it's important that uh, the, the participants have uh, different narratives. So um, we, were, we were able to see like the shared, the common uh, themes of experiences and, um, and learnings from the participants and the uniqueness of, and also the uniqueness of their uh, responses. Thank you. Thank you, RV. In line with that, no, uh, a follow-up concern or question, and this is something probably that you can discuss with Ms. Roldan, no? uh, is there still time and space for you to consider adding a subsection perhaps? It doesn't have to be that extensive, but something that would give your readers no, an idea basically uh, in a more articulated way, no? uh, an idea how your research partners understand healthcare in the context of the pandemic. Because you did say a while ago that there are diverse narratives, which I think is excellent. No? But would it still be possible? Would there still be space in your manuscript to add and, and to, to, to demonstrate that diversity of, of, of narratives or, or of experiences? Um, well, to be completely honest, in terms of manuscript, it's always been like adjusting every week. Uh, while there were a lot of um, while there were a lot of sub-themes within each themes that we explored, a lot of it were also overlapping and a lot of it expressed 
different things. And of course, we'll also make space for that. It is important as well how we understood and how we well interacted with these people and how we perceive the challenges as students or as sociologists is somewhere beyond our field to understand what's going on in the health institution. However, understanding how they respond, how it's understanding that they mobilize towards uh, addressing concerns that affect global and local uh, crises, it's important. And I feel like we'll have space to include it. Yeah? Page limit. Page limit. We'll see. <laughs> Thank you. I think Dr. Abaya has a follow-up question. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, uh, in connection with Dr. Levis's suggestion, I think uh, it's really important that you um, jazz up the whole idea of practice theory. I mean, that, that whole notion of practice by perhaps um, mobilizing the discourse on the sociology of caregiving. I mean, there's that that literature or sociology and also medical anthropology. And, and if, you, if you, you said that you probably have a space for that, I would like you to consult the works of Arthur Kleinman. Arthur Kleinman, he has written a great deal on the anthropology of caregiving and care receiving. So, um, and uh, I think your advisor has copies of Dr. Kleinman's work because I've shared some of this already with her. And so I hope you're going to, you're, you'll be able to sharpen your thinking about health care. And in this, this particular instance, you're, I think it's important. I mean, it's, it might be more instructive to use the category caregiving and care receiving. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, we have five more minutes for questions uh, from, I, from our reviewers or either from our audiences also. Very much welcome. Okay. Am I allowed to say something? Sure, go ahead, Sui. Yeah, okay. Um, thank you very much, um, um, Sir Fras and Sir Nino, for your suggestions. I do agree that um, it is empirically rich, but has to be tightened and integrated with theory, practice theory. Uh, we will consider, or at least I will um, make sure or at least ask the team to try to integrate notions of caregiving. I'm not so sure about the receiving, although from uh, the narratives, um, um, there are no? um, what had to be sacrificed, what had to be given up during the COVID pandemic. So um, to, be, to give one example, uh, despite the specializations of the doctors, they had to just focus and prioritize COVID patients. So the sacrifice by yung non-COVID cases um, in a way. So um, these are just examples. But sige, we, um, thank you very much for pointing out how to enrich this, uh, the manuscript. And if I may interject, uh, Su Yen, perhaps um, a little uh, language editing as, you know, is necessary. I mean, you know, kailangan may copy editing siguro. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for... <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Uh, comments from our reviewers and also uh, a few words from our thesis advisor. Again, we would like to congratulate uh, the research team for conducting this study successfully. A uh, few revisions, but uh, I think we're, let's say, congratulations. So 
we move forward to our next presenter. Thank you so much. For our next presenter, we will be joined by Ms. Dani Con Concepcion to present her study entitled SPED Disrupted, a study on the COVID-19 pandemic uh, affected pediatric Sorry, a study on how the COVID-19 pandemic affected pediatric, special education, and therapy in selected Metro Manila cities. Um, I am the advisor of Ms. Danny Concepcion, and joining us today via Zoom is Ms. Thea Paulino. Unfortunately, Ms. Daryl Bernardino will not be joining us um, due to scheduling concerns. But uh, Again, to remind our presenters, we have 15 minutes for presentation and uh, 20 minutes for Q&A from our reviewers and from our audience. Are you ready, Danny? All right, I turn over the floor to Ms. Danny Concepcion. Good morning, everyone. My name is Danny Concepcion. I am for AB Social Sciences, so I am from the old program. Uh, and I'm here to present my paper entitled Sped Disrupted, a study on how the COVID-19 pandemic affected pediatric special education and therapy in selected Metro Manila cities. So this is how my presentation will go. First, we'll discuss the introduction, literature, methodology, results, and then conclude it. So we begin. What happened to special education during the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, schools closed, of course, um, and learning spaces worldwide uh, worsened pre-existing education disparities, reducing opportunities for children with disabilities to continue learning. Because of the, um, the pandemic, schools had to close and they could no longer meet inside their classrooms. So SPED teachers had to, and occupational therapists had to figure out different ways to continue providing care that uh, the CWDs or children with disabilities need. So this is, um, there was uh, an aspect of care that needed to be added and this is where the parents had to step in. So parents started attending classes with the kids and provided more hands-on assistance at home. So this research is mainly concerned with the following. Uh, first is how the pandemic affected the ability to, provi to provide SPED needs, which CWDs um, require. Next, how the transition to online learning affected CWDs class participation and or their reaction to therapy. And lastly, which areas CWDs are experiencing trouble with uh, in terms of applying what they learn from class into their daily lives. What does the literature say about my study? Well, first, uh, we'll discuss the roles of the teachers, therapists, and the parents prior to the pandemic. So the SPED teachers were in charge of delivering the academic lessons in the classrooms. This included science, math, English, Filipino, so the usual subjects. While occupational therapists would prepare activities that aim to help CWDs learn how to become more independent. So this is usually for gross or fine motor skills, as well as speech and uh, writing. While the parents and guardians were expected to follow through at home uh, through um, making sure that their kids would maintain progress by practicing what they learn at home. What happened to this process during the pandemic? Well, the role of the teachers and the therapists remained the same. Uh, they had to transition online though. Uh, and the role of parents were the ones that really changed because some parents stepped up and attended their kids' classes to assist in the learning process. How did they deliver lessons then? There was a negated turn in regard to the effectiveness of delivering SPED, given the lack of face-to-face -face interactions. And children, according to their parents, were unwilling to adapt to the changes and they were unable to adapt as well. Because while they did the activities that had to be done online in the beginning, their interest lessened as the lockdowns continu continued. So what's the current state of SPED in the Philippines? According to a recent study by Toquero conducted in 2021, online communication was integral to the success of SPED here in the country. Uh, teachers expressed the significance of Facebook as their main avenue to contact parents. And with Facebook being a very familiar platform to everyone, 
it became a good opportunity to reinforce children's lessons through social interaction. So they would interact by commenting on each other's posts in their specific class groups. However, not all families have access to stable internet connection or the proper gadgets. Uh, this led to a wider inequality gap in terms of SPED here in the Philippines during the pandemic. So how do they develop their lessons and evaluate their students online, given that there are no face-to-face -face interactions? We must first take note that everyone has different learning needs, so the children usually require different approaches because of their symptoms or their uh, conditions. So the personal approaches that teachers used to apply to their students are not as effective online because they are not seeing each other in person. So some students find it difficult to stay engaged in their class, they lose focus, and sometimes they log off from Zoom before dismissal time and they don't return. And this, of course, led to uh, less opportunities for social interaction for CWDs. So this is my theoretical framework. Basically, we'll look at education from a sociological perspective. First is social integration. So this is taken from the functionalist theory, wherein uh, in social integration, children are taught a common set of beliefs and values which society, society collectively subscribes to in order to ensure that society will continue to function even in future generations. This is closely tied to socialization, wherein George Herbert Mead describes this as um, the self not being something that people have at birth, but rather is developed through socialization and social interactions and playing roles. Uh, it's only when people participate in socialization that they can form their identities. So this is tied to the third concept, which is play, which George Herbert Mead says, um, in the early stages of development, a child must learn about other people, and also they have to participate in play in order to learn the roles that they have to, um, in society. So they don't have a developed unity of the self, stability, personality, and character yet. And each performance or gesture that they perform in play uh, invokes the next role that they will play, therefore helping them find their place in the world. So now that they're only playing with their parents, their teachers, and their therapists, a lot of my interviewees actually noticed that the kids are more mature because they do not know uh, the role of kids in society because they do not interact with kids their age. So what happens during a disruption? Uh, actually, we're already in a an age of dis disruption, even prior to the pandemic, uh, with uh, global warming, technological advancement, and all. But the responsibility of dealing with disruptions, as well as growing uncertainties that come with it, uh, lie with us, the current generation of learners, uh, and future workers as well. So this changes the dynamic of the education system quite drastically, because people are no longer concerned with what to learn or the contents of their curriculum. But instead, we also need to figure out how to cope with the disruptions and how to turn them into opportunities for ourselves. So my study is qualitative and I um, gather data through semi-structured interviews. I use snowball sampling wherein uh, people sent in contacts for SPED teachers, occupational therapists, and parents of CWDs. So I was able to conduct six interviews two for SPED teachers, two for therapists, and two for parents. However, it's also important to note that the second parent interview was uh, uh, attended by both the mom and dad of the kid. Therefore, my interviewees are seven. These are their profiles. Okay, so for my results, generally among all key informants, it looked like SPED teachers and occupational therapists maximized their space in school or their classrooms in order to keep toys and other materials that could help them adjust uh, activities right away. So when they notice that kids no longer pay attention in class or do not show interest in what they're doing anymore, they can simply grab other materials and then uh, alter the activity a little bit so that the goal for the day can still be reached. Next, during the pandemic with limited resources, the, implement the implementation of distance learning and the flexibility that they used to have for class um, became restrained. So teachers and therapists had to plan their activities a, a week in advance because um, they need to send printable materials to the parents or if they, the parents need to buy any materials or toys, 
uh, they need to give ample time for uh, the parents to meet those requirements. And then in terms of lesson application to real life situations, generally key informants agreed that having children learn from their natural environment is more helpful because they get to practice the skills that they learn in the environment that they are already often in. So they're in the space where they're also most comfortable. Now the sessions for SPED classes and occupational therapy during the pandemic lesson. So there are less synchronous compared to asynchronous classes for SPED. And then for online therapy, uh, it was reduced to around one to three hours per week compared to the two hours daily that kids used to get, uh, thus making limits on socialization even uh, greater. Uh, even with the online setup, allowing parents to um, sort of teach and handle their kids on their own, a lot of them still look forward to the resumption of face-to-face -face classes because the limiting of socialization really made their kids anxious around other people and hesitant to socialize. So even though they're anxious about how on-site activities will affect their kid because they, they've been used to, you know, um, two years of without seeing their classmates, uh, they also think it will be more beneficial in the long run. And lastly, all areas of online learning were a struggle for the teachers, therapists, parents, and students. But while it's easier to teach the kids basic life skills in their homes, uh, there are also many distractions present at home. So they can just simply log off, go to their TV, play other toys, or even watch Netflix or uh, play video games. So I used a thematic analysis, and this is my code book. Um, yes, so I used the codes collaboration, involvement, reaction, socialization, challenges, disadvantages, opportunities, and advantages. So from these, I noticed some patterns uh, from the data that I collected. First, it's harder to get the attention of CWDs online. So according to some therapists, some parents, and teachers, it's really hard to get kids to pay attention online because first, um, there's a lot of distractions at home. Sometimes the one hour session for therapy is only spent to get people's attention. Um, and also therapists and teachers had to adjust. So they had to find different characters that they could flash on screen to get kids' attention. It's not like before where you can just tap them on the shoulder to tell them that they need to pay attention. Next, CWD still thrived academically, actually, because of the pandemic. So according to some parents, it might be the removal of external pressures in the classrooms to catch up with their classmates. And although some teachers said that maybe it's because uh, there was also heavy assistance from the parents when kids do their homework. Uh, next, parents and guardians became more involved with the care of the kids. So they attend the classes and therapy sessions with their kids. They provide hand assistance when needed. And according to one therapist, I give therapy to the parents so that they can give therapy to their kids. So that's uh, the parents became like middlemen in the care for the kids. Because of this, parent-teacher and parent-therapist relationships improved. So parents understood the work of their children's teachers and therapists more. Uh, they became more open with their struggles and they celebrated small wins together. So parents have an open, a more open communication channel. So they have Viber and Facebook Messenger to talk with their uh, kids, par uh, teachers and therapists already. So sometimes parents even send updates without being prompted. And next, CWDs are struggling with social interaction. So like I said earlier, um, there's really a limited uh, opportunity for socialization for kids. And some notable quotes uh, I got from my interviewees. First uh, was that her child no longer knows what the concept of friend is, no matter how many times her parents would try to explain it. Explain it. And according to one teacher, her students really... Uh, treat other kids like they're aliens because they don't know how to act around them anymore. Of course, there were some outliers to the study. The first, uh, there was one parent who said that her relationship with her kid did not change. This is because she left her corporate job when she had her kid. So she's been uh, directly involved in the care of her kid ever since the start. While the other two parents, they said that 
uh, the pandemic really deepened the relationship with their son. Next, in the inclusive school, CWDs became more confident and willing to speak with their classmates. So this is different from the other teacher and therapists who said that their kids are already uh, struggling with socialization. And finally, there were some schools and centers that did not close down at the beginning of the pandemic, while others did. So those that closed down had a hard time transitioning to the online setup or having uh, people to enroll in their schools or centers, while the two centers that smoothly and immediately transitioned online had ties with international institutions, therefore make uh, the institutions already had online um, parameters or protocols in place, and they just adapted that locally. So in conclusion, the lack of socialization and the limiting of face-to-face -face interactions brought about by the pandemic made noticeable effects on the development of CWDs. Positive effects would be uh, excelling academically, while negative would be the hesitation to interact with their peers. Next, the teachers and therapists and their parents all agreed that hands-on care for CWDs would lead to more positive development and faster development as well. Next, for teachers and therapists, seeing the children in their natural environment help them understand family dynamics better and allow them to adjust and instruct accordingly. And lastly, as the pandemic continues, everyone began to find meaning op meaningful opportunities for growth, such as uh, the continuation of strong school and household ties and more hands-on parenting. So as the children grow, so do their parents' understanding of them. And this will lead to more positive development overall. These are the resources that I used for my paper. Thank you so much. And I will now be taking questions. Thank you so much, Danny. Uh, again, we would like to acknowledge the presence of our reviewer, Ms. Thea Paulino, uh, who is on Zoom with us right now, but also Ms. Daryl Bernardino sent her questions in advance. Um, but uh, I can read them on behalf of Ms. Bernardino, but if Ms. Paulino wishes to go ahead also. Hi, Ms. Thea. Yes, you can go ahead first. I can go ahead. Yeah. Um, the questions of Ms. Bernard. All right. Sige. So, Dani, um, Ms. Bernardino has a few comments on the formatting of the paper. But apart from that also, uh, in the discussion of your research findings, she asks particularly, um, to quote, you've mentioned that they kept the children engaged through different means like virtual rewards and were able to adjust the activity slightly by introducing new characters to the kids or finding online videos, songs, and games. Now, question from Ms. Bernardino, are there rewards provided for character formation involving children to socialize? For example, most friendly, most cooperative awards, Maybe the school could also give this as a reward to invite students to interact more with their peers. Are there any rewards of those sorts mentioned? Uh, according to one teacher that I did interview, yes, they have those sorts of virtual awards. So they have um, most friendly awards also. And then for kids who would recite in class or who would uh, do their best in group activities, they would get virtual stars. And then those stars collected um, will be able to, uh, as the more stars they collect, the better their prize will be at the end of the school year. All right. Um, maybe include that in your discussion. Don't forget. Another question. She said, uh, to quote your work, during the pandemic with limited resources and implementation of distance learning, the flexibility of class and therapy activities became a bit more restrained. She asks, what therapy activities were restrained that also resulted to less socialization with other students? Okay, before the therapists, the therapists would be able to hold small group therapy sessions. So the kids will be with uh, two to three other kids their age, and then they would be able to play inside the therapy room together. So this really, uh, because of the pandemic, this was restrained. Uh, right now, there's one therapy center that's already holding small group therapy um, activities, but there are dividers so the kids can't really touch each other. Uh, so that's how it was restrained uh, on site. 
while online, of course, um, even with small group Zoom meetings, uh, some kids still log off right away because they don't want to be around or they don't want to see other people also. All right, include that also, ha. Huh? Uh, another part, another comment. Uh, you mentioned that there's less re- lesson retention is therefore improving because of the online setup. How did the parents and the therapist explain that there are more lesson retention in an online setup? Is there a discussion from the interview where they explain this? Yes. Um, one parent said that it's easier for the kid to retain what they learn from other teachers because the parents are more involved. So the parents, at the start, they had to really send uh, updates to the teachers or the therapists to see uh, if there was progress. So now it's easier for them to retain because of environment changes also. So some parents, they decided to get more uh, plastic cutlery or plastic bowls so that the kids can learn therein. Uh, not just from therapy, but also at home, how to use uh, utensils on their own, how to eat rice, how to recognize shapes using uh, household materials. So now they're able to recognize more things and they're really able to um, uh, retain their lessons because they're able to see from their environment uh, what the teachers and therapists are trying to convey. Okay, thank you so much. So again, maybe just to include those uh, direct quotes from your informants, no? Um, there's one. There's another question, but uh, her comment I think was cut short. Limited opportunities to quote your work. Limited opportunities available for children's play and social interaction. What do the SPED schools provide to, for CWDs to promote play and social interaction? How, how is it different now than from before? So in the SPED school, actually, the teacher did not say that there were any group activities anymore. So they could not play with um, kids their age. Uh, but in the inclusive school, wherein uh, they still have group activities, mm-hmm. Uh, kids are able to play with each other because there are online math games or online games that the teacher found that the kids could play together so that they could still have some sort of social interaction and play integrated to their program. All right. Thank you. And finally, her last question is on asynchronous activities. All right. You've mentioned in your work Asynchronous activities which are often led by parents or guardians instead of instead of teachers and therapists may have contributed to the kids' reluctance to interact with people outside their nuclear family. Her question, why did the teachers decide to have more asynchronous session if there's a possibility that there would be lo- less socialization? Uh, less socialization time for the students. Maybe you could provide a background for this part. Okay, so the for the teachers, uh, they said that there are more asynchronous activities because of the fact that the kids really uh, log off um, ahead of their dismissal time. While others say that their one-hour sessions, usually if they're synchronous, uh, is just really used to get kids' attention. So sometimes... Uh, especially if they're dealing with a big class, it's hard to get everybody's attention at the same time. That's why they had more asynchronous activities so that at least they know that the kids are still doing uh, their work, even if it's with their parents. All right. Thank you so much for your uh, responses, Danny. Uh, I guess overall, um, to include more anecdotal uh, data evidence from your interviews, integrate it into your discussion. All right, thank you so much. I turn over the floor to Ms. Thea. Good morning, and uh, um, congratulations for doing this study. And uh, I would like to ask you, uh, did the teachers tell you what are the specific objectives or skills that they wanted to target during the uh during the pandemic, were there specific skills that 
they really wanted those children to to target that time. Yes. Yeah, so the teachers right now they they mentioned that uh, they do not have assessment or grading systems for the kids anymore now that they're in the pandemic. So what they do have are um, targets per day. So for example, they want the kids to be able to count up to a certain number for the day, or maybe they want the kids to uh, write a specific number of sentences per day. Um, usually that's what they do now. Uh, and those are not graded because they don't want to add on to the pressure already of uh, academic rigors, given that they're also being taught by their parents who are not teachers or therapists themselves. So uh, do they do one-on-one uh, teaching uh, uh, synchronous uh, days with their, ch- with their students, especially when uh, they only hold like small, small, a small number of students per day, right? Do they do like a one-on-one uh, tutoring day synchronously. Yes, Po. Um, they say that they do have uh, synchronous sessions one-on-one with the kids in order to check on their progress and also sometimes to teach some lessons, although they don't always go uh, the way that they're planned. Sometimes uh, teachers will have to switch the activity. So, for example, instead of uh, learning how to count what toys they have in front of them instead it will be like a video or a song that will teach them how to count Um, and that's how they really adapt this time uh, online so there still are one-on-one sessions uh, additional to the class sessions that they have have they they been teaching rather than teaching the uh the subjects that they had to teach, have they been teaching executive skills more than the academics? Um, according to the teachers, they still try with academics. So uh, because a lot of their students are also having therapy, so they don't want uh, para to do the job of the therapists also because uh, the therapists are doing Uh, life skills and independence so even though the teachers also want independence for their kids uh, they try to do it with academics instead so with math with science with reading and writing so what happens to the uh, parents who are not uh, who are working what happens to the children who are attending the classes okay Uh, from the three parents that I interviewed, one quit her corporate job in order to uh, really focus on the development of her kid even before the pandemic. Uh, but there are two parents who are working. So one is the father of a boy and one is the mother of the same boy. The mother has uh, work, but she is night shift because she's in a BPO. So her uh, clients are usually up during the nighttime here in the Philippines. So she's able to really attend to her son's uh, education uh, in the morning when he has his classes or his therapy. Um, And then the father who has day shift, uh, he also tries sometimes to go on leave. So whenever whenever the mother is unable to uh, tend to their kid, he goes on leave so that he can be the one to... uh, catch the role of being uh, the teacher for the day. Okay, thank you very much, Danny, and congratulations. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Ms. Thea. Um, I think, Danny, from uh, the comments of both the reviewers, we need to integrate more of the narrative part um, and weave it into the themes of uh, your discussion, no? Um, and again, we would like to thank Ms. Bernardino and Ms. Paulino for joining us and sending their questions also in guiding how we would develop the study further. So congratulations once again. And thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you, you Ms. Thea. Thank you. Too. All right. So I guess we can proceed with our next presenters. 
uh, we will be joined by Noeli Cubajo, uh, Karen Garcia, and Nina Resurrection to present their paper, Maluluwal Ba Ang Dalamhati? Drawing Out Viable Lives from Pandemic Grieving Spaces. They are advised by a team of, uh, consists of Ms. Cherry Alfiler, Ms. Jessica Claudio, and Dr. Enrique Nina Leviste. Uh, their reviewers are Ms. Eileen Del Rosario Rondilia and Ms. Nicole Torres, who are joining us via Zoom. Noel, Karen, and Nina. Yeah. Um, good morning, everyone. We are Karen, Noeli, and Nina. Thank you for coming today. Our presentation this morning concerns the experience of loss and grief in the time of the COVID-19 pandemic. Loss, in its general sense, derails the bereaved individual from normal routines. However, the COVID-19 pandemic has restricted the pre-pandemic way of grieving, taking away opportunities that were once easily attainable in normal conditions. One group particularly challenged by the pandemic are college students. As students are expected to carry on with their lives despite pandemic challenges, they come face-to-face -face with a unique but not particularly pleasant experience of pandemic loss while juggling other responsibilities in life. Thus, we see the need for sociological sentiment for reasons including the ambition to shed light on how people navigate their way through the new normal while confronted by the ambiguity of loss and new explorable expressions of grief. We intend to focus on how individuals redefine meanings of loss as the pandemic transforms the meaning-making process of grief from an internal individual compulsion to a socially and culturally shaped experience. Our study builds on the following themes and literature. We recognize the importance of discussing the manifestations of loss and the practice of grief among Filipinos because culture influences how Filipinos experience grief as part of their mourning process, which is shaped by religion and our unique resilience culture. In the Philippines, death has been considered a social cultural event with consequential behaviors, ceremonies, and beliefs as manifested in wake and funeral practices. We also investigate the meaning of loss and the construction of grief by discussing how socially predetermined ideas about how to respond to loss and express grief create appropriate behaviors and acceptable norms. These traditions, however, are mutable and may grow over time as a result of individual and collective experiences, such as COVID-19. The bereaved and their response to their loss are shaped by their interaction, prompting universal yet varying understanding of legitimate loss and grievability. We then discuss sociality and social justice in the context of loss and grief. Individuals still suffer from a sense of disconnection despite enduring social connections online because of protracted lack of physical co-presence, especially in funeral, wake, and other death-related settings. However, collective grief has a place in the pandemic as mutual support and shared efforts for recovery are presumably sought after by the bereaved. Finally, we reviewed how grief acts as a liminal space. Grief is experienced even by people isolated in their home amid the pandemic. That can be located in spaces behind the scenes of the everyday, where the bereaved encounters challenges on social confirmation for her entitlement to grieve over the loss of a loved one. Moving on to the methodology, we focused on college students and their vulnerable pandemic circumstances. While efforts have been made to facilitate online learning, there is still much to be done, especially when students have placed themselves under the pretense of needing to be productive in spite of multiple losses in the pandemic. So we selected key informants who are comfortable with sharing their loss experiences with us because past studies suggest that bereaved individuals feel most comfortable talking about their loss with significant others. We collected data through online interviews, which we divided into two parts. So first, we conducted a pre-interview to soften the ground between us and the informants and to gauge whether or not we can proceed with asking more sensitive questions. Second, we conducted a life story interview to draw out a comprehensive account of the life story of our informants in the context of the current pandemic. We also explored their life story before the pandemic to deepen our understanding of their meaning-making process of grief today. 
the transcribed collection of lengthy personal stories were thematically analyzed and interpreted in Atlas. Here in the second column, So here in the second column, we group the data set into the following codes. And in the first column, we group the codes into the following themes, which will be discussed in the discussion and findings. And that said, allow us to discuss our findings, starting off with research demographics. So the key informants of the study are Filipino college students in their early 20s who have experienced losing a loved one in the past two years. Their relationship with the deceased is largely familial, from losing an immediate family member to losing a relative. The first category helps us understand which deaths they consider grievable amid the pandemic. Uh, next, for most of the participants, the cause of death of their loved one is not due to the coronavirus disease, but because of prior illnesses or complications due to the pandemic. The second category helps us understand their meaning-making process of grief in the pandemic, where we negotiate meanings of grief uh, vis-a-vis cultural meaning systems of loss in the new normal. Losses encountered and experienced by all key informants can be sorted into different categories of loss and grief. All deaths shared by them are considered as forced and painful ones. But two of them mentioned how their loved ones had experienced tremendous discomfort and debilitating medical complications before their death. Maria recalled how her grandmother cried out to God, Nako, Panginoon, kunin niyo na po ako. In this context, anticipatory grief was evident as the informants were aware of their loved ones' existing medical illnesses, soon complicated by pandemic conditions. Janela described how people are really getting treated like they are disposable, lamenting over the poor healthcare system present in the Philippines. Having to stay at home due to lockdown restrictions for the past two years, Informants describe the loss experience as isolating and incredibly lonely, especially those who are unable to be with their loved ones in their final moments and cannot physically be with their family to grieve together. Informants describe their loved ones' death as unreal since they were hoping to meet them after this pandemic. As unexpected deaths plagued the pandemic, most informants faced little time to prepare for the loss of their loved ones, especially the elderly. They were shocked and distressed as people passed away earlier than expected. Although they said, mapupunta din naman tayong lahat doon, they reasoned, why must it be during the pandemic? Why must it be this way? All informants underwent normal grief accompanied by emotional or physical response typical of grieving individuals such as finding outlets in schoolwork, jobs, hobbies, and personal relationships. However, there were instances where non-finite grief for lost aspiration and plan was present. They questioned the meaning of their dreams that were once dedicated to their loved ones. Maria's go-to person was her Lola, to whom she would share her dreams of becoming a lawyer. Janela shared the same challenge of redirecting her goals after losing her tatay. Siyempre, nandiyan si mama, nandiyan pa yung kapatid, pero it's not the same na wala na si papa. Lastly, as college students expected to continue their academic responsibilities, our informants experienced suffocated grief. They were preoccupied with schoolwork and org work aside from dealing with the loss of their loved ones and COVID-19 challenges, making the grief process harder than ever. As mentioned by Noelle, grief is complicated by the pandemic. Hence, we find ourselves uncertain about how to deal with the death of our loved ones due to physical distancing measures and lockdown restrictions, for example, that restrict our grief amid the pandemic. And nonetheless, we manifest agency in our grief response by adapting to new social norms, values, and morals in the new normal. So first, a grief response that our informants share is maintaining limited contact from family and friends and refraining from gathering in person. However, they find this to be impersonal because of the absence of physical support. Uh, for instance, Bea, who lost a friend due to COVID-19, found it harder to relate to and empathize with other bereaved individuals who she cannot physically comfort through hugging. Second, they maintain contact with family and friends in the virtual space. For instance, when Juan's mom passed away, his ate arranged and streamed a virtual funeral and memorial service on Facebook for family, friends, and relatives who cannot visit the wake in person. Third, uh, inasmuch as the virtual space can facilitate grief, the informants still preferred grieving with others at a shared physical place. Uh, for instance, when Gloria lost her Lola, her family grieved together at home through shared uh, funeral traditions and burial ceremonies, such as the Pasham and the 40 Days of Prayer. Fourth, they regularly interact with their peers through student organizations and academics. Uh, interestingly, however, extracurricular activities and academics do not facilitate grief 
Instead, they find comfort in the relationships they have formed with their peers through engaging in school-related activities. This suggests that social interaction of any form can facilitate grief by simply not letting the mourner go through grief alone. Lastly, they respond to their loss by living normal lives or by engaging in pre-pandemic social activities online. For instance, Mark, who considers himself a people person, uh, made an effort to maintain his relationships in the virtual space. Hence, a tambay or hanging out was observed online through streaming movies on Discord servers and playing video games together, which captures Mark's normal life before the pandemic. Further, our findings suggest the absence of meaningful collective bereavement within our informants' grieving spaces, despite how the pandemic makes us think that mutual support is spontaneous in these trying times. We thought this was an interesting finding, knowing that we Filipinos are emphasized for our values of pakikisama and malasakit. So this perhaps shows us two things. First, grief is experienced in the imponderabilia and familiar spaces by people isolated at their homes. Our informants prefer to give on their own despite the availability of social connections online, which conflicts with our literature on grief response, which tells um, collective efforts towards recovery. The COVID-19 pandemic advances the idea of grief as becoming a space in its own right, detaching it from physical spaces such as the cemetery or funeral homes where society expects death to be. Um, second, the concept of collective grief does exist but insofar as our informants recognize the ubiquitous experience of loss today, collective does not translate to connection or community. Our informants were victims of disenfranchised grief. They were hesitant to share their grief for fear of being judged because their coping behavior was different from expected. Um, they also described their grief as trivial and not grievable. That is, wala kang karapatan na umiyak kasi lahat ng namamatayan na sa pandemic at nahihirapan ngayon. They do know that grief is happening collectively, but their notion is limited to the silent assumption that everyone is mourning. Unfortunately, this conception of collectiveness discouraged them into isolation rather than encourage um, mutual support. Um, this lack of connection in community spirit can be attributed to protected years of disconnection and a lack of physical co-presence um, due to restrictions. Um, finally, our findings um also show that our informants lamented the desecrated deaths of their loved ones owing to restrictions limiting grieving rights, mourning practices, and medical care. Um, memorial visits were prohibited, deceased bodies had to be cremated within 12 hours, and the government issued a policy on the number of allowable guests. Apart from this, medical restrictions made it difficult for everyone to find a hospital that accommodates non-COVID patients. Um, so these mourning and medical challenges speak volumes about loss and grief, social and cultural dimensions. Specifically, said challenges broach the topic of legitimate loss and deaths worthy of grievability. Unceremonious wakes and constrained grieving rights made it difficult for the informants to make meaning out of their losses, while their struggle for medical attention assert how the pandemic has unnecessarily marginalized non-COVID patients. On another note, how society establishes which losses are valid and invalid is an issue of how operations of power shape the agenda of defining livability. As Judith Butler said, an inherent um, vulnerability characterizes all social existence, making all life precarious. However, norms, social and political organizations and other institutions have developed in context of power to maximize precariousness for some and minimize it for others. Meaning that while all life is equally defined by precariousness, it does not follow that all lives are equally precarious. In the context of the ongoing pandemic, the state of precarity delineates the possibility for livable, livable life as affected by socioeconomic conditions of physical persistence and conditions of social intelligibility. For instance, our financially insecure informants are at heightened risk of violence, risking unintelligibility, and thus their possibility to live a livable life is reduced. All told, our study brings us to the conclusion that the loss experience and grief process have been defined with the challenging situations brought by the COVID-19 pandemic. As we see how the pandemic atomizes us, we begin to recognize the role of culture and rituals and the communal spirit derived from this in dealing with one's grief. Grief then is done with others. Ultimately, the unprecedented experience of loss and grief inflicted by the ongoing pandemic teaches us a new way of thinking about our lives together. We are called to critically and ethically think about the consequential ways in which the human is produced 
reproduced and deproduced in context of precarity and the ever-present recognition of a viable life. So that brings us to the uh, end of our presentation. On behalf of the group, group, I would like to thank you for coming today. Uh, any questions? Uh, unfortunately, our second reviewer uh, will be sending her questions on another time uh, due to scheduling conflicts. So I guess we can proceed with Nicole's question. Okay, sige. Um, so first, I just like to check if I'm coming in clearly because I can turn the video off naman if I'm like lagging or choppy or something. Is it okay? Yes. Okay. Okay, so first, thank you very much for having me on your panel. And then I'd also like to congratulate um, Noelle, Nina, and Karen. I think you you all did really well. Um, putting research together at the best of times can be difficult and your challenges were especially unique. So I think that you should all be very proud of yourselves. Um, on the whole, I found your research comprehensive, your methodology was very thorough, and your data was, um, was very rich. You, um, you explore and apply concepts like liminality and precarity, which I think are very interesting and very relevant you know, as we try to navigate like this new, new normal actually much, much very liminal space where we're in with the pandemic right now. Um, I think that we're also in an especially uniquely challenging time. It feels sometimes like our divisions are so wide and so insurmountable that it's always nice to be reminded of the things that we have in common, so, the, the common experience of loss, the common experience of grief, because that might be what we need to be able to move forward you know, with more compassion and more empathy for other people. Okay, so for, for comments and follow-up questions, I have three um, major ones um, for you to consider to, to see if they can help strengthen your paper because I hope that they can. I wrote them down. I hope it's okay so I don't, I know, so I don't ramble. So I will look at my notes constantly. And I think it's it's actually kind of funny because they kind of align with the theme of today's conference, which is identity and equality and institutions. Okay, so the first one on identity, I think your focus on college-age students is especially interesting. So your focus on essentially your peers is especially interesting. Um, I think that your generation is in a very unique position at this time for both no planet and country because you're at a you're at a time in your lives when you're confronted with many many um, stressors and challenges so yes online learning is one of them but there might also be other um, anxieties and concerns about what your future might look like or what will happen once you graduate etc um you're also at the same time very engaged because you're, you're digital natives. You can navigate that landscape of, um, of the internet and all those opportunities a lot more easily than, well, let's say, my generation could. Um, so I suggest that this, this context be discussed a little more thoroughly at the start. Like you devote a bit more time to talking about that context at the outset especially because your data includes student-specific grief responses. So responses that um, like people my age who are not students anymore might not have, but who, um, who your who people in the same age group might be able to share. 
Um, and then second, uh, this pertains on the COVID-related versus non-COVID-related deaths in your data. Um, I th- in the present manuscript, it wasn't yet very clear to me if there was a difference in how those two things were experienced. So if there was a difference in experience and grief from directly COVID-related deaths, so I think that's two cases in, in your data versus um, all the others which were which were not. So I might I might be wrong and um, I think this is just mostly based on anecdotal evidence that I've heard. But um, I would imagine that the sense of loss might differ a little if a loved one succumbs to you know the virus of the pandemic versus other causes and it just so happened that it happened during the time of the pandemic. So for example, the grief response might be different if it's um, COVID-related because I imagine the sense of guilt would be different. Paano kung ako pala yung nag Or um, the anxiety of what if you're, what if you're infected also, di ba? Um, and then there's also the stigma of what if your house is like, maybe it's considered the COVID house in the neighborhood and is also under individual lockdown itself. So um, those things are those. I, I'm not sure if those things came out in your data, but it might be interesting to expound on a little more if they did. Um, but alternatively, then, kasi interesting din naman to focus on non-COVID deaths during the time of the pandemic. Kung hindi masyadong um, malinaw yung difference um, based on the data that you were able to collect. Um, I think the, the experience really is markedly different. And then you have the baseline of pre-pandemic life. Diba? So kung pre-pandemic, sana nakapaglamay, sana nakauwi galing sa, sa abroad, etc. Um, so that, that brings me to the second theme of the conference, which is inequalities. So I think that um, there might be a need to support a few of the observations that you make further. So, for example, on page 30, you talk about the marginalization of non-COVID patients because of the, because of the lack of um, hospital facilities that were open for them at the time. Um, but at present, your manuscript only cites the experience of one respondent. Um, I think that's a very big statement kasi, di ba, that non-COVID patients feel marginalized but the treatment is unequal at this time. So maybe um, you might need to support that with more literature or anecdotal evidence or um, such as those that were raised in the earlier presentations also. Um, and then lastly, um, so to the third theme of the conference, which is institutions, um, my third suggestion pertains to the recommendations. So I, I, I don't know, I think this might mostly be from my training um, from uh, the policy side of things. But I think I'm always looking for how policy at any level can better be supported by good data and good research. So um, for your recommendations, I think I'd encourage you to also start thinking about how your findings can apply to policy, kahit at an institutional level. Because I think your findings have implications for things that schools and workplaces can better offer. So like time off or you know, social support within the workplace and the school. Ayun, I have I had a few other smaller comments. Um, and then I'd be I'd be happy to send them um separately if you think that they'll be helpful. But I think you all did a really good job. Um, and I'm very happy to have been able the chance to, to have been able to have the chance sorry, to read your paper. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicole, uh, for your comments. And I think the, the research team has duly noted uh, what are the necessary additions, revisions, and implications in policy. I think that's also very helpful um, as we uh, apply the, and also maximize the potentials of this study. No? Um, now, first of all, I would like to thank Nicole no, for accepting the invitation on a relatively short notice and for coming up with a comprehensive review of the manuscript. No, despite your busy schedule, I reckon, no, Nicole. Um, I would like to give um, uh, Noelle, Nina, and Karen a chance to react in their own way no, to, to your comments no, um, with the time left uh, given to them. Okay. 
Uh, good morning po. Uh, thank you again for uh, accepting po to be our reviewer on a short notice. And we'll make sure to um, apply po your comments while we edit the paper po. Um, to address po the COVID-related deaths with a non-COVID-related deaths po, um, possibly po kasi we only interviewed uh, one informant po with a COVID-related death. So perhaps future studies po uh, can interview uh, deaths uh, due to COVID and probably compare it with a death not due to COVID and a death complicated by COVID. Just to add to what Nina said, um, um, our research po kasi was exploratory. So at first we were still um, navigating which kinds of losses are we going to include in the study. So um, what appeared were just, were mostly non-COVID deaths po. So, and that one participant who experienced a COVID death um, with her loved one, um, unfortunately, did not expound on that kind of loss. Parang what really affected her was the non-COVID death she experienced. So um, as Nina said, po, I think it would be a good point of further discussion po, to also include or also focus on COVID-19 deaths. Um, to add lang din po siguro, like um, for the current manuscript, maybe we can focus po on how these non-COVID related deaths are like um are not part of like the numbers and statistics that we usually see. So um it's like how can we help on um showing these life are publicly publicly grievable too and they are they deserve to be like have that public traces especially for those who are left behind yeah that's good i think all of those are all of those are good points you just need to say at the start na parang the study is exploratory and this is the data that we got for now okay parang okay naman okay naman lang yun All right. Thank you so much uh, uh, to our presenters, to Nicole, especially for uh, joining us this morning. Again, many no notes for our revision stage, but congratulations once again to the research team for a successful presentation. All right. So I guess we can move forward to our next panel, which is on histories, modernities, and culture. We have two presenters for this panel. First, we have Carl Eli Alconis, who will be presenting on Viva Vegan, histories of modernity in a UNESCO heritage city, followed by uh, the group of Paolo... Miguel Maligalig, Dominic Pamatpat, and Stephen Adrian Pataxil, who will be presenting their work entitled Kain Po, a study on the relationship of adobo with the formation of a national Filipino identity. Uh, you would like to call on the floor Carl Eli Alconis to present his work. Um, hello. What is modernity in a city that builds its identity on its connection to the past? Good morning to everyone. Closer to the mic. Sorry. Good morning to everyone. I am Carl Ida Alconis, and it's my pleasure to present to you today my thesis entitled Viva Vegan Histories of Modernity in the UNESCO World Heritage City. I'll begin first by going through a brief overview of the background and a theory. I will then elaborate on the research problem and the methods taken to answer this problem. Then I will be discussing and analyzing the results before concluding. To begin, let's take a look at Vigan. Vigan is a city on the northwestern coast of the Philippines and the capital of the Lopasur province. Built near the mouth of the Abra River, it has historically been a local urban center on the Lopas coast. 
it was inscribed by UNESCO into the World Heritage List in 1999 for being the best preserved example of a European trading town in Asia. Today, the local government and their legislation see heritage as a tool for development. This means that cultural heritage conservation has become tied to the improvement of local's quality of life. Now, modernity is often characterized as a break from tradition, showing the discontinuity of time. And due to the historical conditions that which brought forth globalization, um, modernity has most often been theorized through a Western lens. This has led to a spatial bias, privileging Western sites and consigning others to backwardness. However, there has been in re recent decades um, a rising understanding of modernity as diversifying with globalization. For example, Robinson broadens the def definition of modernity as um, contemporaneity and change, redefining modern spaces as sites of all kinds of social change. Gankar, meanwhile, describes modernity as having variations caused by site-specific adaptations leading to alternative modernities. Lastly, Knopf deals with the alternatively modern, saying that it emerges in the articulation between global forces of so-called progress and local sensibilities and responses. These are the frameworks that I utilized in this study. Often, world uh, heritage and tradition are held opposite modernity. However, there are several ways by which society's preoccupation with heritage is actually rooted in modernity. For instance, heritage is being tied both to situations of crisis and decline and to situations of progress, which characterize the modern world. Heritage can also be seen as a mixing of the old and new. Especially in the global south, heritage is used to promote countries and to make them more visible internationally. Through heritage tourism, economic development is pursued within these nations and also causes the intensification of global flows and contact with the other. Considering this, the paper focuses on the question of modernity in a city which capitalizes on its historical significance. It aims to uncover how vegans population construct and understand modernity. It also, seeing modernity as contemporaneity and change, analyzes locals' experiences of change in the city since its World Heritage inscription as localized histories of modernity. I made use of unstructured interviews with 10 locals, including seven residents and three members of Vegan's daytime population. I also interviewed two government representatives from the City Cultural Affairs and Tourism Office and the City Social Welfare and Development Office, as well as an anthropologist and an architect. The participants were reached through key local contacts. Interviews were then recorded, transcribed, and later analyzed for shared themes. Supporting documents were also procured from the City Engineering Office and the City Cultural Affairs and Tourism Office. Here we have a table of the different respondents, as well as the themes which they touched on in their interviews. Now, the interviews uncovered various themes among residents' contemporary experiences of the city. These include tourism and economic development, awareness of the city's value, shifting traditions, reconfiguration of public spaces, increasing interconnections and conflicts arising with the recent changes. First, we have tourism and economic development. Among the interviewed locals, the change in contemporary vegan is described with a view towards economic development. This is manifested in different things, such as experiences of growing chances for employment, infrastructure improvements, business establishments, and the fall of poverty incidents in the city. Now this economic development in vegan is connected by the locals and the experts to the emergence of the tourism industry. This is most prevalent, prevalent in the experience of the workers interviewed. Milo, for example, said, our food used to just be the simple kind, but now we can buy tastier food, the kind that we never had the chance to taste before. Here we see also a difference in how residents and workers gave um, describe the progress experienced in vegan. While the residents gave a general overview of the present compared to the past, the workers followed a more nuanced narration where economic improvement rests on the fluctuation of tourist arrivals. When there are many tourists, things are good. And when there are none, it's the same as before. Nonetheless, the economic improvement brought by tourism has led to a seeming conflation of these two notions. Some locals, for example, equated what is good for a town to having more tourist spots and rec recognize the development of the city as attracting more tourists. On the other hand, this also shows the reliance of a large part on the, of the city on the income brought on by tourism. This is most seen in the COVID-19 pandemic when many tourism workers suffered and had to close their businesses and the tourism industry lost around 230 million pesos. Another theme shared among some respondents was of their awareness of the city. 
While Juan said that he was already aware of the city's value back then, this was the exception, as others said that they had not been aware of just how valuable the city was before. This is why there have now emerged efforts to increase awareness of the city, not only for tourists, but also for its citizens. Jane from the tourism office, for example, referred to their holding of various webinars and seminars on the city's heritage, including one targeting students expected to be the city's future vanguards. Aside from the government, however, other sectors also contribute. For example, Joyce recounted how she learned about vegans' historical value through a school program. Aside from this, mass media, including the shows, films, and commercials shot in vegan, also plays a role in shaping local pride of place. All in all, these processes make for the promotion of a sense of ownership of the city through which locals may then be involved in its preservation. Through the interviews, I also interviewed that and covered that contemporary vegan is a site of, for the shifting of traditions, for the decline of some and the rise of others. Among the residents and workers, there was great awareness of the various festivals celebrated by the city. For the residents, there are occasions of merrymaking marked by parades and various programs in the city plaza. Residents recognized the novelty of some of these festivals, including the Kanawidan Festival and the Renyag Twilight Festival, both of which were instituted within the past two decades. For Joyce, however, it's interesting to note that the Viva Vegan Festival of the Arts, also known as Binatbatan, is considered a, a tradition of vegan ever since, despite beginning only in 1993. All of this shows how these festivals are invented traditions, which, though instituted, attempt to establish a continuity with a distant past. While festivals are created, however, intangible heritage traditions in vegan are also facing challenges. Anna and Bernadette both pointed to the aging populations engaged in the traditional industries of vegan and their disconnect with the younger population. Meanwhile, Jane mentioned the dwindling availability of local clay for the practitioners of vegans to pottery traditions as a problem. For the former example, Bernadette pointed to a contradiction in the framing of intangible heritage conservation and the quest for economic progress. While efforts to turn the industries into tourist drawers have made it so that they don't die out, it remains difficult to marry yearnings for economic progress and the relatively meager income that these vocations give. The newfound valuing of vegans' heritage brought to the fore efforts to conserve the urban fabric of the city's historical core. This includes ordinances from 1997 delineating heritage core and buffer zones and the respective allowable uses, as well as the Vegan Conservation Code passed in 2006 with amended building and renovation guidelines. Due to these, alterations in new constructions in the core zone are strictly regulated, needing the approval of the Vegan Conservation Council, of which Jacinta is part. This is also something experienced by the homeowners in the core zone, and even by the shop owners renting out spaces on the house's ground floors. This does not mean, however, that the city stays the same as it was before. Indeed, changes have occurred in the city, including the construction of more tourist attractions and the uniformization of empanada stalls. Most notably, the, core, the roads in the core zone have been paved with cobblestone. Movement within the core zone is also in a way regulated to highlight heritage for the viewer. This can be seen in the pedestrianization of Calle Crisologo, the main heritage street, and the organization of the Calesta parking areas and routes. These phenomena display signs of the musealization of vegan score zone, characterized first by the alteration of function seen in the conversion of areas to commercial zones for tourists, as well as of Calesas from transportation for locals to a tourist attraction. Second, altered contexts seen in the explicit attempt to play up the history of vegan, such as the paving of the streets. And third, a new posture of admiration between the viewer and the city, seen in the tourists visiting vegan to experience heritage, and even in the selection of the pedestrianized area due to its spectacular view. In recent years, experiences of globalization and connection to places outside the locale have increased. This is seen first in the inclusion of vegan in networks of commodity exchange. Unlike before, souvenir vendors now source many of their wares from places beyond vegan. This includes the sourcing of crafts and paintings from Bicol and the use of mass-produced shirts. Meanwhile, vegans' own products are finding their way to other places through craft fairs. The most ubiquitous experience of globalization, however, is that of the encounter with tourists who have been growing in number. Many of the residents talked about some form of interaction with, or observation of the tourist arrivals in Vegan. Interestingly, they pointed out the new Seven Wonders city recognition as the catalyst for growing tourist arrivals. This is further supported by this statistical data, which shows a 242.52% growth of tourist arrivals from 2014, the year before the city's bid, to 2019. 
With the changes in the city, there have also been sites for tension and conflict. Among these is the rising expense of living in vegan. This includes higher taxes, pricier business permits, and more expensive commodities, which have brought on challenges for the residents. The imposition of strict rules on construction in the core zone may also cause conflict, as Regina alluded to, the expenses of the building materials required. Others may attempt to circumvent these guidelines, as Jacinta has noted, these actors coming into conflict with the Vegan Conservation Council. A prominent site for the generation of conflict is the interaction between locals and tourists due to heritage tourism. Among these, the residents spoke about the tourists taking over spaces to which used to be available to them. Heavy traffic and a lack of parking space was also a cause for concern among the respondents, with some going as far as to compare them with the past, where there were less cars and according to them, life was simpler. Resource shortages have also hounded the city, especially when it comes to meat and vegetables during peak tourist seasons. The high volume of tourists inevitably leads to high volume of waste, which is something the city also grapples with. Joy mentioned, Joyce mentioned, for example, the garbage left behind after Holy Week events by the throngs of locals and tourists. These instances all point to a modernity which is fraught with tension. It's important to note, however, that despite these conflicts, the residents in the interviews highlighted the positive effects of, the her of heritage tourism on the economy. This shows just how pervasive the notions of economic progress have become in vegan. Indeed, it is this pervasiveness which must be acknowledged in our analysis of the data. Notions of progress vis-a-vis -vis the past are prevalent when the residents speak about how vegan has improved, how it's developed, how it's grown. However, the uniqueness of modernity and vegan lies in the focus placed on culture, cultural heritage conservation and heritage tourism as a means to this improvement. Indeed, we find in vegan the performance of heritage, of history, experienced both by tourists and locals. This is apparent in the guidelines to ensure even new buildings are in harmony with the historical core, in the pavement of cobblestone roads, in the invention of new traditions, and even in the raising of awareness of vegans' heritage. These measures have led to intensifying experiences of globalization, first through commodity exchange, but especially through tourism, which creates chances for the interaction between those from vegan and those from different places. This has also led to contradictions and conflict. The preservation of intangible heritage, for example, may find itself clashing with modern values that promote speed, efficiency, and homogenization. The increase of tourists has also caused some tension for the residents who now find themselves having to share the city and its limited resources with others. Overall, these show varied histories of change in the city. Different groups who interact with the city in different ways may have different experiences, as seen in how workers describe the city's economic development compared to residents. From all of this, we can see in vegan narratives of development connected with efforts to preserve and restore, a modernity which harnesses and constructs history to reach aspirations of improvement. Both affected by and affecting this conception of modernity, the local histories of change in vegan foreground economic development, increasing pride of place, invented traditions, musealization, intensifying experiences of globalization and the navigation of tensions brought about by heritage tourism. Vegan, it appears, is then is not held in stasis, but is filled with the novelty and change which has come to define the modern city. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much for your presentation, Eli. Um, I think the reviewers would be sending their comments uh, later on, but I would also like to acknowledge the presence of your uh, advisors, Dr. Alfred uh, Pavlik and Dr. Rick Sarfuentes, who are here with us on site today. Um, and I would turn over the mic to them first for a, a few comments in your presentation. Is this already live? Okay. And we will be opening the floor for questions from the audience on online or on site also for questions. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Cherry. Thank you, Eli, for your presentation. Uh, I liked it very much. Turned out quite well. We had uh, a lot of uh, quite intensive discussions and, and uh, meetings over the past weeks. And it was very interesting to see how, how this uh, theme, how, how the research got into shape and went towards A, this presentation you all saw, and B, of course, a, a manuscript draft that uh, we are still developing, but I think we are already quite far. And I, I hope that uh, we will uh, not run out of time and that, that everything will be submitted well. 
and of course hopefully the editor of the journal and, and the reviewers of the journal will, will also like it um, i would like to acknowledge the presence of dr fernando salsita our professor emeritus who was so kind to uh, agree to serve as a reviewer of the research of, of Eli, together with uh, Ms. Mylene Leasing, who will send her review uh, through email. She couldn't attend in person. I think there's a family uh, emergency she, she had to uh, go to. Uh, but of course, uh, we will uh, carefully consider uh, all the comments from the reviewers, but also from the audience, uh, if there are, and they will immensely help Eli to improve the final uh, output of, of his research. I think now I just turn over to Professor Schalzita for his comments. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. I'm sorry to be late for the presentation because I was used to the usual entry points. I didn't realize I should have asked a taxi to drop me off at gate one. Instead, I dropped off at gate two and a half. Wrong, wrong move. Anyway, um, my, my, uh, thank you, uh, Carl, for talking about a, a city that has meant so much to me. As you know very well, in the 1990s, a great part of my time and energy were spent trying to stay vegan together with heritage advocates in the city. Because at the time, only the only one street was really protected, the Sologo Street. Our challenge was to expand the protection to the entire historic core, which consists of sev several blocks of streets. Um, and so that meant organizing two international conferences, organizing Viva Vegan Festival, which you mentioned, organizing consciousness raising seminars, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now I have, a, I have two questions basically. Yes, sir. Um, are you saying that modernity entered the consciousness of people in vegan only with the entry of tourism in the oh. 1990s, um, 2020, 2000? Uh, that is one question. My second question is, are you saying that it's tourism that caused the decline of the hand-woven hand textiles? No. Sorry, kind of clarify. Um, uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, for the first question, sir, it's not necessarily to say that, uh, that tourism is what has caused modernity to emerge within the minds of locals. However, it's important to note how over the years um, the conceptions of locals of mod mo modernity has come to encompass um, heritage tourism and cultural her heritage preservation and how they have come to align this with their notions of what is modern of what is new sir and for the second question sir uh, it is not tourism which has led to the decline of the these um, intangible traditions, sir. How, uh, in, indeed, it was mentioned by one of the participants that um, due to the efforts to preserve um, these, um, for example, a bell weaving through tourism, uh, it, these have persisted. They have not died out. Um, and I, I believe she said that, um, my respondent said that if these efforts had not been taken, uh, um, to say to say it in Filipino, she she said that mamamatay na yung mga yan. However, um, she says that she she told me that it remains difficult for for um for the people who are attempting to promote these traditions to align it with more uh with these yearnings of economic improvement, sir. The uh yes, sir. Okay, I think uh, you have to clarify what you mean by modernity because. There are two ways of actualizing modernity. One is modernity as, free, as a free-for-all, unregulated uh, development. And that has always been with vegan since the 1950s. You can see that clearly in uh, Quezon Boulevard, Quezon yes, Avenue, which goes all the way to the Simbana Basit, yes, the cemetery. 
they're, they're the, the growth of business un unregulated. It's a free for all, no height restrictions, no design restrictions. There are no, uh, there are no uh, regulations to, as to where you can park. Actually, uh, what was intended by, by heritage advocates was actually a regulated type of development. Yes, sir. So uh, a development that would respect architectural heritage, that would have uh, height restrictions, that would make the city more walkable. Yes, sir. So I think you have to, to define what you mean by modernity, because it's confusing. I mean, you know, there, modernity has two phases. One is free for all that uh, favors uh, instant gain. It favors homogenization, again, for instant gain. There's another type of modernity that seeks, uh, that welcomes uh, heterogeneity because it, it, it seeks quality tourism. It wants to develop niche, a niche for a particular place because as we know, the global, global market is highly competitive. Yes, so vegan really had no assets. So the idea was to develop a particular asset, a niche for vegan. So I think you have to clarify what you mean by by modernity. Yes. The second point is, I got confused because in at least three sections in your in your essay, you kept you kept talking about the decline of uh, speeding in relation to tourism and the desire for improvement in life. It's confusing. It wasn't explained clearly. The fact is, the reason why textile weaving has declined in vegan is because of the entry of cheap uh, mass-produced textiles. This has been going for, for more than a century now. The idea precisely of a heritage advocate was to create a market for hand-woven uh, Ilocano textiles. The problem though is, again, this is where the notion of the two modernities comes in because what is happening is that the storekeepers on the main street, Cristologo, are not really after quality tourism. They just want to sell any kind of product, even if the products do not come from vegan. That's what they want to do. So it's, it's so hard to get uh, artisanal products from Ilocos itself on Calle Cristologo. So I, I think that has to be clarified. Um, well, you're in the team that's doing research on gold filigree from Bantay. Right in Crisologo, it's, it's very difficult to come across a, a shop that really specializes in gold filigree from Bantay because they're attracting mass tourists who don't want to pay premium prices for quality. That is a problem. So I think that is to be clarified in your thesis. Um, um, uh, sorry, sir, may I, may I clarify something about that, mm. sir? Um, I, it was my uh, aim to say in my thesis that um, the decline of these traditions, such as the Abel weaving tradition, came despite the efforts of people to promote it through tourism, sir, and not because of tourism, sir. Yeah, but it's not cl clarified yes, sir. because you kept repeating it three times, three or four times, that you, 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 can, you cannot find this in the shop. Why? Why can you not find it in the tourist shops on Cristologo? That's weird. It's because of the attitude of store vendors. Yes, sir. That is their attitude. They want products that can that are cheap, even if the products come from from outside Ilocos. They want to sell things cheaply, and this is the same. That's the same problem that's affecting the gold filigree. They want cheap imitations so they can money make money quickly. Yes. And uh, this lack of attention actually to Ilocano heritage may not make tourism in vegan sustainable. That's what I fear. Because they're inventing festivals that are generic. Uh, it's the same, same formula all over the Philippines, street dancing with plenty of colors. So after a while, it gets tiring. So they have to, they have to do more research on Ilocano heritage, but they're not doing it. Because uh, University of Northern Philippines actually has a course on Ilocano, Ilocano heritage studies. It's supposed to be promoted, but they're not doing it because they're not getting enough students there also. Again, that mentality, 
um, they want something that can give them instant profit. So that is the problem. It's a, cert it's a certain way of looking at modernity. It's a certain way of looking at development. It's development in terms of instant growth. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Shalsita. Uh, any response to the comments? Um, uh, uh, I would like most of all to thank Dr. Zialsita for um, these comments and suggestions as uh, he, um, these are all very important things to consider. Um, of course, the thesis will be under, undergoing revisions after this, and these will be um, included in the th thesis especially since they concern the different, how people um, construct and uh, how they understand the modern and how this affects the preservation of the culture in the city. All right, thank you so much, Eli, for your presentations and uh, presentation and congratulations. Now we move onwards to our next presenter. <laughs> Our second presenter from the panel two, this consists of uh, Paolo Maligalig, Dominic Pamatpat, and Stephen Pataxil, who will be presenting their work entitled Adobo, Understanding filipino -ness. In a dish, they are advised by Dr. Shalsita, who is with, here with us today. And the reviewers are Dr. Uh, Poson Lorenzana and Ms. Pia Castillo. Good day! I'm Virtual Paolo and physically presenting today are my group mates Stephen Pataxil and Dominic Pamatman. We will be sharing with you our thesis, Adobo, Imagining filipino -ness Through a Dish, with our findings and analysis. Next slide, please. Good day! I'm Virtual Paolo and physically... The contents of our presentation are the following. Next slide, please. The contents of our presentation The Philippines has a naturally rich and diverse culture. With that being said, we aim to understand how Filipinos form an idea of their national identity, which unites them despite the diversity. We believe that commonalities and how Filipinos perceive the nation's identity is a binding factor that builds an imagined community we are all part of. Using food as a tool, particularly the so-called national dish adobo, we aim to identify how the dish encapsulates being Filipino. The Philippines has a natural... So for the significance of the study, we hope to really understand what makes a nation a nation and how we experience this. The common belief is that a unified nation is uniform, but for nations just like the Philippines, which is very diverse, this concept of uniformity we see is questionable. 
So we'll try to determine how despite these differences that come with diversity do we see us part of one unified nation. In and through our differences, what commonalities do we think, recognize, and feel within ourselves that links us, connects us, and brings us together? For adobo, what is that one taste or feeling about the dish that makes us all have in common? We think that given that the Philippines is not the only nation that is diverse, other nations will resonate with our question and will want to learn more about our study. Not only to understand the Philippines, but to have another perspective in understanding their own selves and their own nas national identities. To understand what it means to be part of our own nations. The issue of what constitutes a nation is one that is not unique to the Philippines, but is a pressing issue for the order and organization of the whole world. What is our basis for unity in our localities, nationalities, and international space? So for our research questions and objectives, our main thesis question is how do Filipinos define their identity in and through adobo? Despite wide variations in taste and preparations, many Filipinos believe that adobo is the national dish. Why do they believe this to be so? And how do they define filipino -ness through food? Next slide, please. For our research, listed below are our research objectives. Why is adobo important to Filipinos? How does cooking adobo dramatize being a Filipino? And how do Filipinos arrive, conceive of themselves as members of an imagined Filipino community? Listed below. Into this because our study is very theory heavy, so please bear with me. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so three overall themes came out as we perused through existing literature regarding nationhood, culture, and food and identity. So, firstly, existing literature describes nationhood based on two perspectives. The first is an object, is an objective or object centered approach, usually found in social studies textbooks distributed across Philippine elementary and high schools. So a good example of this would be the idea of isang bansa, isang lahi, with lahi or race um, being the object of focus. So we decided, however, to take a more subject-centered approach. So the approach we chose is based mainly on Benedict Anderson's Imagined Communities. In this work, he describes being part of a nation as more of a feeling of participation or belonging. What this means is that the subjects will be the ones to define the commonalities they use to identify with each other more so demonstrate that what is national cannot necessarily be pinned down to a single definition because we have to be as inclusive as possible in our study, especially in the case of the Philippines, which is a very diverse country. So the idea of the nation as imagined is also central here because, for example, me as a Tagalog from Manila, I'm still capable of identifying myself with an Ilocano from Ilocos as both Filipino, even if we may essentially never meet and may be very, very different as people. So the commonalities I would identify um, would then be purely subjective and purely up to me. So this also showcases Ernest Renan's idea of a national spirit with it also taking root in a more subject-centered point of view. So overall, this approach is the most inclusive and what we deem the most appropriate for our study. Secondly, defining what can be considered Filipino also has two approaches. First is the indigenous approach, again, mostly found in textbooks, that attempt to define Filipino culture essentially as the culture of our ancestors or yung kultura ng mga ninuno. So this approach, although valid, is kind of purist. So we decided to take again the second perspective, a second perspective of culture as dynamic. So this is the perspective shared by authors such as Niels Mulder, Nico Keen, and Father Bernard, who look at culture as something that evolves. So it encourages an approach that is more contemporary because it allows us to take into account what our participants think um, it means to be to, uh, what think it means to be Filipino in the modern day. A value that actually becomes more critical in the latter portions of our paper is the value of Pakikisama. So we chose to, like, to take a look at this value as a theme because uh, Frank Lynch essentially defines it as acting with sensitivity to others' feelings. So it encourages um, Filipinos to adjust and be accommodating to a variety of tastes and personalities, which again makes the study more open to the idea of culture as dynamic. Thirdly, we also see how food is a showcase of one's identity and can function as a national symbol. For the most part, the significance of food must be rooted in the everyday lives of people. So this is usually in relation to things like how much a food is consumed across the country or even abroad, and also how it is recognized by people as being a simple, a symbol of something important to them. So Hong Sek Cho, for example, describes kimchi as an example of a symbol for Koreanness, 
because of all of these factors. Next, um, Iger Ramos also proposes the idea of the memory of taste with the act of consuming food, eliciting feelings and memories associated with one's identity. Food as memory becomes central to our study as well um, because we did in fact uh, take time to study the life and experiences of our participants and a double positionality in these. So next slide. Okay, so for the research design, we centered our study around the concepts of food as a form of uh, expressing identity and its relationship to the formation of a national identity. We began by looking at the lives of the participants to see how Adobo is situated within it. We sought out any commonalities brought up in both their life stories of the participants and their thoughts on Adobo as a national symbol in order to create a framework that showcases what Adobo can tell us about the formation of a national identity. <clears throat> So <clears throat> for the interest of time, I'll be delving into the selected regions and participants criteria. So firstly, we chose Manila as we would seek to study the variant of adobo in which we are most familiar with. Secondly, we chose Pampanga due to its uh, being a different ethnic group despite its general proximity to Manila. More importantly, there's also a great sense of pride among Kapampangans with regard to their traditions, most especially their culinary tradition. We also chose Southern Tagalog, specifically Laguna due to its strong use of coconut milk or gata in their cuisine. And lastly, we selected Ilocos in order to add in a different ethnic group and diversify our pool of interviewees. Their linguistic and geographical differences were also an important factor as the region's mountainous terrain would provide and restrict access to a variety of ingredients when used um, in making adobo. Okay, and the participants sought after would be uh, no more than three participants per region, <clears throat> which, have, which would add up in total to 12 participants. Uh, each participant will be an adult with at least a high school education who cooks for pure enjoyment or as a hobby. This means that participants may not be chefs, professional cooks, or paid house cooks. So we were able to uh, gather a vast range of participants that were uh, ranging from teachers, students, nurses, et cetera, who ranged around the ages of 20 to 75 years old. Okay, so for the findings, um, given the interest of time, on the presentation slides, I've added quotes from some of the participants so that you may read it when you can. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> so in order to better understand our findings, uh, our group has decided on laying it out based on subsections as follows. So what makes adobo popular? What is an adobo? What is the taste people look for in adobo? And what is the aroma they associate with it? What is the texture of adobo? And what do Filipinos associate with it? So what makes adobo popular? <clears throat> So we described in our paper just how popular adobo is. And based on our interviews, they all seem to agree that adobo is a very popular dish, not just locally within the Philippines, but also internationally. Regarding, adobo, uh, regarding adobo's malleability and adaptability, uh, based, on, based on Tess and Lara's insight, the ingredients are easy to gather and is cheap to acquire generally. Adobo is also cooked for different reasons and uses. Some cook adobo because of how easy it is to cook. Some people cook it uh, because of how adjustable it is uh, based on who you're serving it to, while others cook adobo juice to its taste and also its ability to preserve itself for a long, dur uh, for a long duration. <clears throat> so based on our interviews, our group has identified and confirmed with the majority of our interviews the list of five fundamental ingredients that comprise the adobo dish. That is vinegar, garlic, peppercorns, bay leaf, and soy sauce. So, and then the second point, rice is often mentioned by our interviewees due to the agreed notion that adobo is nicely paired with rice. I think this is best exemplified by one of our participants who said um, that she loves salty adobo and that it goes well with rice. Some of our interviews mentioned how rice is often paired when they eat adobo. And one of the main reasons is because of its ability to absorb the adobo sauce. And then for the third, we noticed that adobo is cooked um, without using accurate measurements. Rather, they relied on the idea of pencha or estimates. This is um, mostly embodied by Lara from Laguna, who mentions how estimates are how she cooks when she makes adobo. And we believe that this is because of how they were taught and also how they were brought up and also how they, um, they've been cooking adobo for quite a long time. So in a sense, it's a muscle memory sort of thing. They have a deep understanding of how adobo should taste to them. So what is the taste people look for in adobo? In order to present this section, our group thought it would be best if we organized it based on four regions that we got our participants from. So from Ilocos, uh, Ellie says that salty adobo with rice go well together, as mentioned earlier. Well, on the other hand, LJ says that he doesn't want it too salty, rather just wants it enough to 
um, flavored the meat and the sauce. While there's also, on the other hand, Liza, who mentions an Ilocano version of adobo, which is more sour in taste. Wherein she says that she likes adobos where you can taste the sourness. In Pampanga, um, the taste profile is based on RJ, and it's summarized by him, where the taste is more on balanced side, not too salty, not too sour, where you can uh, taste all three aspects. Uh, for Laguna, uh, it's predominantly mentioned by Tess and Lara, but they both seek out the sour taste. But it was also Tess who mentioned having a little bit of everything, so somewhat also of a balanced taste. Manila's taste preferences are kind of similar to Laguna's, wherein they seek a sourness taste. Here we got Wendell, who mentions that uh, a double for him needs to taste sour. It was also Wendell who said that we as people have different tastes. Sometimes we like salty, sometimes we like sweet. So based on our understanding, there isn't a definite taste when it comes to a region's preferences, and we believe that that's all right. It showcases to us just how diverse we are, despite even coming from the same region or even from the same country. So what aroma do they associate with adobo? Aroma is, a, aroma is an important aspect to any dish uh, when one is serving to other people. LJ from Ilocos mentions how important the sense of smell is. He says, I think it has to have a lot of aromatics. It has to be very appetizing just from the smell alone. So based on what our participants have said, there's only usually one aroma that they mostly look for, and that is the garlicky aroma. Wendell mentions that it is meant to be crushed so that it can enhance the taste while also enhancing the aroma that comes with it. And we see now that it's understandable why garlic is one of the most common and sought after ingredients in an adobo dishes composition, because not only does it supply flavor, but it also enhances the aroma. So what is the texture of adobo? An interesting aspect of adobo that we encountered was the texture of it. Um, and the textures that stood out the most were saucy, oily, dry, soft, and crunchy. And all of them have their various reasons for use. So the crunchy and soft adobo is mentioned mostly by Wendell from Manila. For him, this was said um, to be enjoyed more on uh, by the younger people who tend to enjoy more of the crunchy side, while older people tend to enjoy more of the softer adobo because of how they sometimes struggle to chew. Another important comparison made by LJ and Liza, both from Ilocos, on the difference between Ilocano adobo and Manila adobo. LJ says it's oily and dryly, and that's a distinct Ilocano style while the manila adobo has a lot of sauce. Ellie from Ilocos pointed out the practicality of the dry and saucy adobo. For her, cooking the two types are not based on, what, on where she's from, but rather on where and how she and her family will eat the adobo. They usually eat dry adobo when they're traveling, while on the other hand, they eat the saucy adobo whenever they're at home. They utilize the adobo's adaptability in this, cook, in this case. Cooking it as a dry texture allows them to store it and bring, them, bring it along with them when they travel. Okay, so what do Filipinos associate adobo with? So we asked our participants, why do you like to cook? And they all gave very colorful answers. And after listening to all of them, we saw that Filipinos associate adobo with two concepts. That's memory and pakikisama. As we all know, food has the ability to bring back memories of the past. And in Ellie's case, it is her comfort food because whenever she eats adobo, she remembers her 10 hour trips that she would take with her family. Um, Ellie also says that your favorite food is associated with memories that you have when you were as a kid. It needs to have a kick somewhere in your memory. While for Pakikisama, it's very hard to please the Filipino taste, and yet we still try. We still cook not for ourselves, but for others. We as Filipinos have this value of Pakikisama that makes us want to include others. And RJ says, to be a person for others, you have to advocate for everyone's good and welfare, not just for your own. Whether that is friends, family, etc., we cook so that we can feel a sense of belongingness in this community that we've shared through our food. LJ said that when people appreciate your food, it's like all your hard work is rewarded. Okay, so okay, so next we're going to present our analysis. So our findings showcase a flexible sense of the national among our participants. So for the most part, they see adobo as a dish that is flexible as it can be adjusted to be served on different occasions for a variety of tastes. Take LJ, for example, who adds pineapple chunks and juice every now and then, and has a habit of switching between the dry Ilocano version and the saucy or Tagalog version, depending on his preference. Strikingly, he also adds pasta, which showcases a very open attitude toward modifying adobo. So this attitude is shared among other participants, as well as with each of them making modifications according to the tastes of those that they are going to serve or for themselves. So there is, however, a recognition of the five basic ingredients. When looked at, however, through the lens of Anderson, we see how the modifications do not necessarily take away from adobo's identity, but simply add on to it through adding more variants. Even in cases where ingredients are replaced, such as that of Lara, 
who replaces suka or vinegar with sinigang mi mix to increase sourness, this version can still be recognized as a legitimate adobo despite replacing, despite replacing, replacing an ingredient. So when asked to describe what it means to be Filipino, we got a host of answers ranging from Filipinos as adaptable to Filipinos being simply whoever is officially a citizen under the charter. So this showcases Renan's idea of a national spirit as the participants acknowledge the idea of a Filipino community, but their answers varied. So participants also demonstrated an interest in variants of adobo, not their own, such as RJ, who spoke about wanting to try a version of adobo uh, made with gata. So this showcases the kind of national consciousness which Anderson describes. Even in the case of LJ, who was our sole participant that disagreed with adobo being a national dish, he cites that Filipinos in the mountainous regions might not have access to some of these ingredients. So even if he disagrees um, with the rest of the group, he still demonstrates that same national consciousness. Next, next slide, sorry. Okay, so we, yeah, next slide, okay. We also found that Pakikisama played a major role in how our participants viewed adobo on two levels. Firstly, on an individual scale, its malleability as a dish allows it to be a tool for cooks to adjust the, var the varying tastes and palates of the people they're trying to serve. This means that no one will be left out when they serve the dish. RJ from Pampanga, for example, describes how he sometimes takes away the oregano, the oregano he uses in his adobo while serving his cousins who do not necessarily like oregano. Wendell from Manila, for example, um, again, serves crunchy adobo to children while serving the softer version to the elderly. Again, pairing it with rice also allows consumers to make their own personal adjustments to the strength of the flavor so as not to offend the chef. And the dish's ability to be extended also allows it to be more inclusive since it can serve more people in a household and serve them for longer as well. So with these reasons, with these reasons cited by the participants, we see Pakehisama in action as represented in adobo. Lastly, adobo represents what it means to be Filipino as it is an evolving dish. Our participants stipulated a wide variety of modifications that they personally make, as well as multiple varieties taught to them by the people, by elders or people that taught them how to cook. So what we see here is Mulder's, Joaquin's, and Bernard's theory in action as what we legitimize and what the participants legitimize as adobo evolves and changes with the passage of time in the same way that what it means to be Filipino evolves and changes as well with the passage of time. Yeah, go ahead. For a conclusion, to answer a main research question posed earlier in the paper, how do Filipinos define their identity in and through adobo? Our research team conducted online interviews with various Filipinos of different backgrounds. What we discovered in these interviews, and along with our readings, is that Filipinos view adobo as a reflection of their adaptability and diversity as a people with its modularity and availability of ingredients being key factors in its popularity. Filipinos also define their identity through the value of Pakikisama, as it draws them to identify with each other and with other groups across the Philippines, whom they are conscious of regardless of differences. Thank you so much. That, that ends the presentation. All right, with us also on Zoom is the third member of the research team, Paolo Maligalig. And also, you would like to acknowledge the presence of our reviewer, Doc Anjo Lorenzana, who is with us via Zoom. Hi, Doc Anjo. Hello. And, and, their, and their thesis advisor, Dr. Shalsita, who is with us here on site also. We'd like to turn over the floor to Doc Anjo for questions um, and if Miss Pia also sent her questions in advance that would be entertained also. Sige, take it away Doc Anjo. All right. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much for the presentation. Hello, Dr. Shalsita. <laughs> right. And um, well, of course, hello to our, um, uh, I mean, uh, members of, of the group. Okay. And uh, so as colleagues here, um, um, Mom Mary and of course, uh, Alfred, okay, who else? Jesse and Glenda and uh, Cherry and Mom Bernie. And of course, to my students. Well, you know, anthropology is about kinship and should establish kinship all the time, okay? Um, and so we celebrate um, the thesis today, it's about lunch, by the way. So 
I think it is the, the most befitting topic. <laughs> so we will all have, uh, you know, not, not just um, a lively conversation before we uh, declare, uh, you know, whether the students uh, pass or fail, but, you know, and a hearty lunch to celebrate for that matter. Okay. Um, so let me approach your work, um, okay, uh, critically first, and then um, later, uh, you know, uh, as, as part of uh, the larger conversation on, um, yeah, Filipino identity. Okay, um, now, when I say uh, critically, so let us look back during the proposal stage, okay? So I, I was looking for, um, you know, certain kinds of uh, parang developments in your work. And, and in the proposal stage, one of my comments was, um, you know, a better conceptualization of the relationship between uh, food and national identity. So um, based on the manuscript, um, there is a discussion on how national identities are actually constituted via Gellner, ideas of Gellner, Anderson, and of course, our uh, local thinkers. Um, so you quoted um, Hilda Cordero Fernando, Nick Joaquin, and Father Bernard. Um, where's the connection to food? How does food, you know, contribute to national identity? Yeah. Theoretically speaking. I can't hear you. <laughs> you you're you're uh, muted actually. Uh, Paula Maligalig, you're muted, and then um, the other two are also muted. Yeah, so you should um, unmute uh, your microphones from, um, yes, now I can hear. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for the question, Dr. Lorenzana. Um, actually, um, maybe just to clarify as well. Um, so the, the lens that we took here um, is less about studying how food contributes to um, the like the formation of a national identity because the that's a that's the more object centered pro approach that um we discussed in the earlier portion um of the RL. So what we wanted to really do is um show how food is kind of an expression of national identity. So it roots itself in the participants and in the subjects themselves and in their perceptions. So it's less so the lens we take is less about um how food contributes, but rather how the participants see food as um, part of or as an expression of their of their identity. So it's kind of like it's the other way around. Yes, 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 yes. So the reason why I asked is because it's not clear in the manuscript. We will. Right? So that, that has to be made clear. And um, the distinction you make between objective and subjective, hmm, I think in the current thinking, there is more of a dialectic relationship between the material and the symbolic. Okay. So, uh, because food is really a material experience, diba? it's corporeal, diba? And, and, and this is what this thesis brings into the conversation. All right? Yeah, so, 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 so I was thinking of, you know, a better articulation in your framework about how um, this subjective dimension or the perceptions about food actually contribute to the notion of Filipinoness, okay? And that means to say, um, it, it's really making references, and, and this was uh, pointed out already in the proposal stage, um, making references to previous, um, you know, uh, case studies in other societies. Diba? Or what you have is only one case study, kimchi. Diba? Um, and, and you have to draw out more from, from the kimchi experience. All right? Okay. And, and, and also, um, 
uh, as again pointed out during the proposal defense, um, it's not just people who contribute to our understanding of a dish. There's of course media, because it's, uh, so when you say uh, again subjective, uh, does that include perceptions? And, and perceptions are actually, you know, coming from different entities. It can be the perception of, you know, uh, people who actually consume and produce adobo, okay? And, and there's also, uh, you know, perception in terms of um, institutions, diba? like the media and, and the cooking establishment. And of course, as I pointed out again in the proposal defense, the state. And I was wondering, diba? during the time you were making the thesis, you know, there, there was a really um, interesting controversy that feeds into your work, diba? Uh, an attempt by, what's that, DOT, Department of Tourism or DTI, to define adobo, to standardize adobo. Diba? Parang, oh my God, all the ingredients are there to really put together this, this discourse on, on, on adobo, okay? And, and really make your contribution to that, to that uh, very interesting conversation. So, so, so I was looking for these particular elements that you can sort of tie together to articulate um, the research problem. Mm. All right? Okay. Yeah, so, so I was looking for that actually, you, you know, it's due diligence. You know, that's the reason why we have the proposal defense, you have the same members of the panel so we can really follow through um, the work, okay? Yeah. Now, let's go to the more interesting part of your work. Okay, now first, um, what we call the customary um, phrases from the reader. I really enjoyed your data. After all, Dr. Um, Charles Sita uh, sort of prefaced that this is really more anthropological work. And I, I must say, you, you really have good uh, but, um, uh, data in, in, that you gathered actually. In fact, you know, um, it also allowed me to make my own conclusion of what adobo is, but, but that's something I will reserve for later, okay? <laughs> right, okay? So, so I enjoyed the data. Um, now, I was wondering, um, okay, um, well, it's a limitation of your work, okay? To confine um, your respondents to Pampanga, Laguna, Ilocos, if I'm correct, yeah? Oh, so tatlo lang yon, right? Four. Four, and Manila, yeah? Oh, okay. Now, um, I think in your data, and even in the introduction, there has to be a, a kind of statement on adobo as a dish and adobo as a way of cooking, all right? Because in, in your data, you referred to, um, you know, I, I mean, it was already assumed that it's pork and to some extent chicken, maybe there's one entry on chicken adobo, diba? But um, again, this was also a conversation during your, your proposal defense that, that uh, adobo is a procedure, diba? a way of cooking. Diba? So it could be adobong kangkong, adobong manok, okay, adobong baboy. Diba? Um, and so now here comes the question of the Philippine identity. Because um, when you say pork adobo as perhaps the default mode, okay, what about, you know, for example, we just celebrated, by the way, Eid il Fatur, diba? So, oh, how about the Muslims in Mindanao? Do they identify with adobo? And if so, what is the form? Did you consider that in your work? Or you can take it personal. Okay. Um, okay, uh, just to... Uh, thank you again also for the question. So just to address this as well. Um, so we focused on the on these specific regions mainly for logistical purposes, but we acknowledge that um 
beyond the confines of the zone, there are probably and most likely going to be um, very, very different conceptions about um, what adobo can and should be. Um, so um, we actually added that in the recommendations of the papers so that any future studies would include all of these other regions mm -hmm. that may be a little bit more diverse. And I guess also the reason why, why we wanted to focus on these areas in Luzon is to showcase how even if um, there is some geographical proximity, um, there is still going to be some variation and still going to be some level of diversity in terms of how adobo is and can be conceptualized by the participants. All right, yes, but that's in the recommendation, but you're talking about Filipino identity and, um, you know, the running thread, if we're going to do a word cloud in, of your manuscript, the keywords that always uh, sort of come up would be, diba? Uh, inclusivity, you know, diversity, right? So might as well, in your introduction, already prompt the reader, all right? that, uh, you know, when you say Filipino-ness, uh, you can have uh, an encompassing sense diba, of, of what Filipino-ness means, diba? Yeah, encompassing means em embracing, uh, right? Uh, because, you know, you, you know this, this concept of national identity is really hard to pin down unless you set the parameters, right, from the start. And, and when it comes to, to Philippine identity, you know how it is contested, right? And, and uh, by default, I, I think you're taking a more inclusive stance on, on what Filipino-ness is, diba? So at, at least, you know, to acknowledge that there are variations, okay, that extend beyond pork, okay, then might as well consider that, you know, uh, there, there could be adobo variations as a cooking method right, in Mindanao. Um, the reason why I'm saying this is, you know, um, there is this dish cooked in adobo style that is so popular in ano, in uh, Maguindanao. And of course, by, by, by uh, uh, you know, by extension in, in other uh, Muslim um, places, okay? And, and it's so delicious. You call uh, it, uh, they use, um, you know, goat meat, diba? Where is Joel? My God, he should know this, diba? Oh, nga, ang sarap sarap nito. I, when, whenever I visit, um, you know, uh, Maguindanao, I always look for this dish. <laughs> oh, nga, ang sarap sarap. So, but it's mixed with ano, uh, other spices like I, I think um, turmeric gives that yellow color, right? It's adobo with turmeric, diba? Okay, so, so, so you own. So uh, I, I mean, um, okay, because this is an ethnographic paper, so we should be sensitive, you know, to, to, the, to the variations, okay? Right? And, and, and the discussion should be woven into um, the, the narrative or, or the essay of, of what adobo is, even if your focus is on the, uh, the, the Luzon construction of adobo, there has to be this acknowledgement of the other variations, you know, okay, because um, of course, uh, th th that's the way we think in, in anthropology, uh, right? So to, be, to, to be encompassing, okay? So it's, it's really a balance between uh, the, the focus, okay, and then, of course, um, you know, the context in, in which this case studies is being uh, sort of um, investigated, okay. Um, so, so, so there, okay, on, on um, how you are, uh, yeah, I, I think the points that, that I am emphasizing in, in this, uh, you know, uh, oral examination, Okay, are these uh, sort of um, parang discussions that, that need to be present in order to um, further contextualize your, your findings? Because um, like what I told you earlier, yeah, you, I, I mean, um, even, the, <laughs> even if the quotes are short, they're quite, you know, um, substantial. 
okay? So, so I, I think um, th that's something commendable in your work, okay? Right, so um, again, um, the other question before I turn over to uh, Mampia, okay, I wonder if she's here, yeah. Um, the other question um, has to do with, um, okay, the way you um, interviewed your participants, okay? Um, because again, this is, uh, something that relates to my earlier question on how you are thinking about adobo in relation to Filipino mess, okay? So did you actually ask questions first about the dish or did you actually ask questions about the dish and being Filipino? What's the order of your questioning? Even if it's uh, a kind of questionnaire that you deploy that is more ethnographic, but still in practice, when you actually ask the the questions to your sort of, you know, memory. Okay, what was the order? Um, so the order was first asking them about their experiences about adobo, like um, how they would learn to cook it. Um, mm. so generally, questions about the dish. Um, the latter portion, however, is where we really like delved into. Like we asked them questions like, um, what comes into your mind when you hear the phrase Filipino identity? So we tried to be more explicit when it when it came to studying Filipino identity in the latter portion of the of the interviews. Right. In, in the first question, did, did they already mention adobo being something Filipino or what? Um so in okay, how do I put this? Um so the at the beginning of the interviews, we asked them first like what their memories regarding adobo are. And then we asked, and then we asked them to peruse whether or not they might consider it as a national dish. So most of them did agree with it. However, we did have um, one or two participants that one or two participants that um, disagreed with it being a national dish. So we um, went for a more personal approach at first, and then we started to try to integrate um, concepts that might be a little harder to grasp. Like once they got comfortable, once they were more willing to share their own personal experiences, and once they might um, be more willing to give us more explicit answers with regard to higher concepts. Right, right, right. So there it is. I was looking for a discussion on people who disagreed. Hmm. Okay, okay. okay, and why? That is really productive, okay? So you, you have to go back to your data and, and, and that's a really exciting addition to your paper, okay? Hmm. And also, um, again, this is a conceptual problem that I really would like you to, to sort of ponder on. Um, okay, because food is, is really a heavy concept in anthropology and it's all related to you know, perceptions, memory, and then history. Okay, and then you were saying um, that food is personal to your uh, informants. Okay, and um, kaya nga para I was thinking of a framework where you can connect, you know, this, this very personal experience to this really abstract notion of um, Filipino-ness, <laughs> you know what I mean? So what, what is my, okay, as a reader, what, what is my conceptual handle? Okay? Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Because, um, you know, when you make that, that leap, diba, from the personal experience, okay, to this imagined notion of Filipino-ness, diba, what will allow me to make that connection? Hmm. Mm -hmm. RL and going back to the data. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If anyone from the research team yes. uh -oh. uh, would like to add a few words. Um okay. Speaking of, um okay, uh, I guess I can answer this also. Um yeah, so we'll be sure to um, make sure to add that, um, especially not in our review related literature, to maybe kind of expand it more to include um, all of those other perspectives. And we'll be sure to also to go back to our data so that maybe we can try to peruse more um, the our, our interviewee who 
did actually like contrast compared or like did actually disagree with everyone else. So we'll we'll be sure to go back to that as well and apply it to the the following revision. Right, right. Okay. Um. Yeah. <laughs> That's all for now. Thank you so much. Yeah. We would also like to read uh, a question from the chat box from Dr. Roselis. Uh, interesting presentation. However, you've not mentioned the debated contention that adobo was inherited as part of Spanish cuisine, but elaborated upon. Uh, how do you factor the alleged Spanish dimension into the notion of Filipino-ness or national identity? There's been several uh, disparate observations on national identity. One of the sources of usually friendly but often impassioned debate among Filipino ethnic groups is their representation of a particular dish. Uh, example given, adobo, as the legitimate or best version. So diversity is emphasized here in the imagined national taste context. Further, why no mention of government's attempt to standardize adobo as the national, uh, uh, the Filipino, sorry, the Filipino identity? Finally, an interesting study would be how the adobo di diaspora treats adobo as a key defining identity. Uh, the dish, at least, is what Filipino mothers apparently make sure their Phil Am or Phil European daughters learn to cook. So, yon. any comments on the Spanish dimension, if we are going uh, to summarize? Uh, um, how do you factor the alleged Spanish dimension into the notion of Filipino-ness or national identity? Okay, this is my bad. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So I guess this has to do um, more with the second section of our RL where we um, talked about what we can define as Filipino. So this kind of roots itself in the um, indigenous versus dynamic conception of culture. So more often than not, what we see is that um, those who would consider adobo as a Spanish dish tend to have this notion that um, Philippine culture in the modern day has been tainted supposedly by colonialism. So this is where we kind of Took into, took into account um, Mulder's, Bernard's, and Joaquin's perspective that um, the way that history has gone and all of the things that we've inherited, the way the manners of cooking that we that we've made, things like that, um, have all sort of contributed to how um, what's this? To how we can conceptualize and legitimize Filipino culture as something that's ever evolving, and with adobo as an expression of that, so too can the dish um, be made Filipino because it is it is Filipino today. Um, and it's also like a product of that history and of all of those expressions. And maybe I guess to add to this as well, um, maybe to kind of legitimize a bit the, the indigenous approach in a way, um, we also remember um, we, we also know that adobo is a it was, it was a was a method of preservation as well, um, made use of prior to the arrival of the Spanish. So there, so like I guess maybe on both on both ways of thinking about how we define. Um, culture or like the identity of adobo, like there's still a way to argue for for its Filipinoness. All right, and also if you would like to comment on the government's attempt to standardize, other members of the uh, research team also can comment. Um, um, just to clarify, um, this is the the DTI. A proposal for making a standardized a standardized adobo. Um, so the reason we weren't um so we, we might actually um include this as well um in terms of like discussing other cases and institutions, but the main reason as well that we didn't really include it is because we really wanted to focus on um the participants' perceptions as well. So we didn't really want like there wasn't so like for like since we acknowledge that there's already this um, um a lot of discussions about adobo in terms of like how institutions view it how um how food writers might view it how all of these intellectuals might view it so we really wanted to really like uh get the perspective of people on the ground um by really focusing on the subjects and on the participants who are more or less regular people in terms of how they would want it so that's why we didn't really like want that's why we didn't really include the perspectives of institutions since it's not really as much of a priority as the perspectives of the participants for us. 
All right. Uh, any words from our uh, participant online? Uh, another comment from oh, sorry go ahead paulo no uh, i think uh dom said it on thank you all right another comment uh the ridicule online that met the dti attempt reinforces your view that adobo is a diverse expression of filipinoness thank you All right. Uh, I think Miss Pia would be sending her comments na lang to you on a much later time. Uh, but thank you so much, Doc Anjo, Dr. Salsita with us here, and members of the research team. Uh, congratulations and thank you. Ah. I was I arrived, by the way. I, I would just apologize. I arrived so much in a haste. I forgot to congratulate the... Uh, uh, Carl for his paper. I actually enjoyed reading it because I love the writing. It's beautifully written. You know? And I like the, uh, the attempt to locate the notion of modernity within an evolving frame. I like that very much. I'm just asking to please realize that there are different strains of modernity at work. That's all. But otherwise, I enjoy the paper. Thank you so much, Dr. Salsita, for the additional comments for Eli. Thank you. And congratulations to our second team presenting under panel two, uh, Dom, uh, Stephen, and Paolo also for present successfully presenting your paper this morning. Thank you so much for your presentations and congratulations. All right. So this is where we would be ending the first part of our uh, student conference this morning. We will be taking a break and we will be back at uh, 1.30 for our third panel and our fourth panel consecutively, right? Thank you so much to our viewers online on Zoom. Thank you to our reviewers present as well and our professors present here with us this morning. Thank you so much. And we will resume today's discussion at 1.30.